Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Praveen. I'm one of the co-organizers of the Go Meetup uh, Bangalore. Um, welcome to Go Meetup 48. Um, so I am one of the co-organizers. Ankur over here at the back is another co-organizer who's here. Hi, Ankur. Uh, so we are three organizers. Uh, third person is Dinesh, who's not here yet, but is likely to join uh, later on. Uh, today, I'm sure you guys have already read that uh, we're going to have a meetup with the uh, DGraph uh, with Manish and Francisc. Um, so in total, we have uh, three talks planned for today. Uh, one is by uh, Sanjay from Hotstar and two talks by uh, people from DGraph. And at the end of the event, we're going to have a open AMA round where anyone from the audience can ask uh, questions to Manish and Francisc. Uh, that'll be the last thing. Um, DGraph has also sponsored lunch for today. Uh, I think it is uh, probably pizzas. Um, just to like, just before we get started, um, there's a pantry over here uh, which is open for all of you to uh, have some uh, water and some light snacks. All the restrooms are down the alley, uh, so feel free. Uh, like before we start off, uh, it will probably be 10-15 more minutes before we start. So if you'd like to take a break and uh, have some refreshments, please do. Um, yeah, once we uh, once we start off, we're going to have two talks back to back with a small break in between, uh, and then another talk later on for, a, for an hour. Uh, and that'll be followed by uh, snacks or lunch. Um, and uh, then, the, then we'll have the AMA round. Uh, so if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, either to me or to Ankur. Um, and uh, just a poll, how many of you are here for the first time? Is this your first meetup? Nice, okay, so welcome all of you. Uh, just to let you know, we ha we have uh, meetups every month, uh, typically at various venues. Most people are uh, kind of uh, companies come forward and uh, uh, are generally open to hosting us. So it's at a different place each time. Uh, we typically have about 50, 60 people attending uh, month on month, um, and uh, we are expecting a slightly larger crowd here today. So let's hope uh, more people turn up. Um, so we as uh, Golang Bangalore, we have two initiatives. One is the Go Monthly Meetup. Uh, we also have something called Go Study Group India, which is, a, which is an online meetup of sorts, which we occasionally host. We used to host it uh, every two weeks uh, on a Thursday, which is a one hour Zoom call, which people can just attend uh, from their homes. And uh, that gives a different avenue for uh, having a different set of uh, um, uh, either either a presentation or some sort of a uh, code jam and things like that. Um, so these are two things that we do. Um, a new thing that we are starting off is uh, the women who go uh, chapter in Bangalore. Uh, this is for all the women who are here. I see one who is already part of it. Uh, so so that is something that's going to start off from this month onwards. Um, so. Uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to Ankur or me uh, if you have any questions and if you'd like to volunteer or help out. Uh, we'll be here throughout the event. Uh, thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, for the first talk, what we have is uh, high order functions in Go and uh, how uh, we are using it at Hotstar. Uh, little bit about me. So uh, my name is Sanjay. I'm a software engineer at Hotstar. I'm working with the personalization team here. It's during the whole tenure at uh, Hotstar, I've been using Go to build uh, services. And uh, before that, I was a full-time Java developer. So um, uh, I'm not an expert at it. So please bear with me if the talk comes out to be very basic. Uh, and about Hotstar and what gets me excited and running here every day, uh, this is the kind of scale we deal with. I'm sure you would have heard about the concurrency numbers that we have breached. And uh, it's not just the concurrency, it's just about the whole data flow that goes in and goes out and our, our, how much our services churn. So we do around 1 million event ingestion per second. Uh, all these events come with huge storage. So we have around 14 terabytes of storage. And then even the consumption patterns goes as high as 8 terabytes. So Working at this scale, like, excite, like these problems are not something which you will see outside. So it, this one is pretty unique to Hotstar. 
And for what are we covering today? Uh, we'll cover how we are using Go at uh, my team, which is personalization. Uh, how did it all start with Go? And uh, what happens when you write Go the Java style? And then uh, what are the problems we face? And then how, how did high order function sort of helped us uh, do things better in Go than what we used to do in Java? And then we'll summarize it, whatever we learn from here. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, so my team serves recommendations to uh, all the users who are coming on the platform. And uh, what we do is we process a lot of events and we generate recommendations and then we serve out. Now, both the services which consumes event and the service which serves it out are built on Go. So the service which generates a recommendation serves around 8 million plus recommendations per minute. And that's around the peak times that's there. This is how a normal day looks like. And in terms of event uh, consumption, we do roughly 1 million plus on a day-to-day -day basis on days which are peaks of for say IPL or World Cup days, those are even higher for us. Uh, but on any regular day, we would do 1 million plus events per minute for one of our consumers and we have like many such for our different use cases. So uh, how did it all start? Uh, we had in the beginning, like an year ago, we had a lot of uh, offline processes which were running uh, computes uh, and different aggregations, ETLs, and those were kind of generating recommendations. And based on the use cases that we had, these were going to different data stores. Uh, we had three at that time, Redis, Elasticsearch, Dynamo. We had one more, which was Aerospike, but we got rid of it. Now, um, with these three different stores, we needed a serving layer, which would actually serve this out. A uh, normal use case, which you would see which you would see everywhere. But then this is what we were missing at that point of time. And uh, we needed a serving layer. So we started building it. And what we thought is a generic layer, uh, something which we could serve out of all these three. And that's how a tray service was born. Um, what we call a tray is a list of recommendations that we serve out for different use cases. So this is how our need generated. Uh, we already had some part written in Go, so uh, I started with Go, and uh, this is what happens when uh, I try to write code. So if you look at it, this is the plain Java code. You start with, okay, every three databases, so let's just start with an interface, uh, and then have a tray service, have a final statement, and then a get tray method. You can initialize different tray services with different interfaces of databases. And uh, this was what was there in my mind. And as something, someone who's really new to Go, interfaces were something which is very similar. So I just transported it to, this is how it looked in Go. So interfaces stayed, uh, the class converted into struct, and then uh, Go has duct typing. So I just had to implement this method for the type. So this is how my trace service was ready. And I was good to go. So what I did next was just have interfaces for uh, like structs for both of my uh, databases types. And based on the use case, I could just initialize the database uh, and start using it. Like pretty straightforward, nothing uh, fancy about it. Now I thought, okay, let's go and test, test this out. I write, start writing test cases around it so that I can test it before it goes to production. So this was my first test. Uh, uh, I was very used to using Mokito, PowerMock, and all the fancy stuff which comes with Java. So, but this was pretty straightforward. I just had to create one more class, mock db, uh, get a method, and then just use it. Now, so far, so good. Everything was falling in place, but then I had more requirements around it. Uh, you see this user type, it's free. Uh, I wanted to test more things out around how is it if it's premium. Uh, we have many such packs at Hotstar and subscription types, and this governs how do, which content do I serve you? Do I serve you premium mode or VIP mode? Now, how do I test this out? Uh, the method doesn't take anything else, and um, there's nothing much I could do. 
So this is where I was stuck. Uh, so I moved on. I read more about it, but then I found out that I was doing things wrong. Uh, Go is not Java. I could. I this is what I did next. I created two structs: uh, a free database and uh, a premium, and two methods, and then use it in two different classes. Uh, very naive. Uh, didn't feel right at that point of time. So I thought I would be doing something wrong at some point of time. So I read about it, and uh, this is what I found out: that Go was primarily built for robustness. Uh, there's a very nice talk by Francis on robustness. I, I suggest you go through it. And then the most important part was clarity, that there's no hidden things that goes around. That's why all the Spring Boot magic, which I was used to, is not there in Go. It's very plain and simple. There's uh, very basic things for dependency injections, no annotations, no constructors, no method overloadings. I can't have same name with different parameters very frustrating in the beginning but yeah i got used to it and then no exceptions there was this concept of error which i was very new to so i read about more about go and i found out functions uh, there's a plethora of different type of functions i could have uh, there's a very nice article on uh, medium which is a uh, zoo of zoo of Go functions. It talks about different type of functions which are there and uh, how could we use it. So I went through named functions, anonymous functions, uh, methods, first class functions, higher order functions, and closures. Uh, how many of you have used closures before? OK, yeah, good. So um, this is how I uh, got about into functions. And uh, I came to know about function types. So functions in Go is like, First class members, you can have them as member like objects and pass them around. And uh, that's how I rewrote my whole uh, service to be. I had uh, two function types. One was for getting user and the other was for getting tray. And all I could do was just pass that function. And uh, this is how, uh, so this is a high order function, uh, which returns actually a function out of uh, function and how I used it was this. Uh, these are closures. So closure is something which uh, covers up uh, variables and holds them up. Uh, this is what we I rewrote for uh, Dino and Redis. Uh, these two methods would uh, send out functions for getting users out of these databases. And now getting users looked simply like this. These two lines. Uh, felt way lot better than what I was doing before in Java. And then covering to testing. This is what I was struggling before when I was doing with uh, Go interfaces. And this is how I had now. Now since, it's, uh, now, since I'm using high order functions, I could pass any number of variables here. And it could close all of them in my inner function that's returning. And this would just shell out the result of a user. And the same function, I can use it in any number of use cases. Now, if I want to test more things out, I could just add it to my uh, higher function, and it would just flow in uh, at rest of the places. Seems very clean, very neat than what I was doing before. Uh, way a lot more happier than uh, earlier. Now, uh, this was this whole journey of me uh, transitioning from uh, Java style of coding, where I was very used to interfaces, and then coming on to more towards functional side. Uh, there is more catch to uh, this uh, about using closures. Do like any one of you know about memory leaks that could happen around closures? Okay, so uh, okay, so if if this is a local variable, then the scope of it is limited to the calling method. Now, your GC would know that uh, all the enclosing variables which are there would not be used after the scope and would cease to exist after that. So your GC would collect the memory space and clean it. But what happens if you define it as global? Your GC would never know that uh, the, the, these uh, variables are not used anymore. So these will keep on be in your memory for a longer period of time. 
and that's what causes a memory leak around closures so some gotcha which i figured out the hard way and uh, it made my life really easy in terms of testing it out uh, without the use of power mock or mockito which I, which is like very magic uh, doesn't feel right now when i go back to java and try to figure out uh, the java code so uh, kt kit takeaways sorry uh, from this is the functional aspects of go uh, the high order function that i went through uh, the closures uh, the uh, the leaks that could happen uh, closures as global variables are harmful and this is not to take anything away from interfaces right this was primarily a use case which was very suitable for us so if you have interfaces which are which have single methods then probably there is more merit in using uh, higher order functions and closures to support them rather than sticking with interfaces but if you have uh, more complicated use cases around uh, multiple methods you need to break down into multiple functions then in that case interface is still uh, good plus if you want to expose more than what your uh, interfaces does so since uh, go does duck typing you can anyways have builder things and other things that go to goes around so uh not taking anything away from interfaces uh this was just a opinionated uh view on what someone coming from a different language background has on when he makes a language transition uh i think uh that's all and if 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 you guys like about uh what my team does or uh, what i've talked about so far uh you can check out our website there's a lot more fancier stuff than what was there in this talk and you can uh, go through our blogs i think uh that's all for this particular talk uh thank you uh so uh not sure if, if, like since this was a very basic uh talk um, uh any questions if there are still any yeah yeah yes so i don't think you have to take care of that and go right uh, when you start uh, with a pointer and then when you so there is no concept of null in uh, uh, go there's a nil thing but i not sure whether you can initialize it for a pointer type so that problem doesn't happen here uh, anything else uh, does golang no? provide the stream kind of things in java yet? what we have uh sorry vanita i don't think i can hear this uh, is there any question uh anything on zoom yeah there is no? a okay question. cool thank you uh, yeah please yeah miss most uh, from java uh to be honest i don't think i miss miss much any now <laughs> yeah i think that's all yeah initially i was missing a lot about collections i mean simple things as set uh not there i have to write things on my own very difficult but then there is merits to it yeah yeah thank you guys yeah that's all for this particular talk so hi everybody i'm francesc campoy and uh today i'm going to be talking about dgraph uh and in general graph databases and a couple of things that we that i built as a demo which is basically trying to explore the world of Pokemon with uh, graph databases. So yeah, that is the title of the talk. So uh, about me, I lead product at dgraph and uh, I joined three months ago, four months ago, something like that. Uh, and I'm on Twitter on GitHub. And before that, I've done a couple of things that you might have heard about. So just for funk is one of the things and someone had a question about that. I'll answer that later. And also the Google Cloud Platform podcast, that's something I created and apparently people still listen to it. So that's cool. So the agenda uh, is going to be, we're going to start talking a little bit about graphs and databases and graph on databases and graph databases, the three things. And then we'll talk about DGraph specifically, how it works, what is the architecture, uh, which is actually quite interesting. And then the DGraph query language, which is called GraphQL plus minus. And then we do a live demo. And for the live demo, I'll have to move things around, but we'll get there eventually. 
Um, also have Q&A at the end, but if there's anything that seems weird or you have questions, just raise your hand and ask. That's totally fine. We're hiring. So yeah, <laughs> we are hiring. So uh, we are hiring here in Bangalore, we're hiring in San Francisco, and we're also hiring for senior people all around the world. So if you're interested, let us know. dgraph.io slash career, just in case you're not seeing it. Cool, so let's talk about graphs. Uh, how many of you have used graphs before? Okay, cool, most of you. Uh, and for those that have not raised your hand, probably you have also used graphs even if you don't know about them. Uh, so this is an example of a graph. This is actually a data set that we use for many examples for, this is actually the data, the data set that you're gonna see if you go to our playground. And it is basically uh, 21 million notes talking about movies and directors and things like that. So here what we have is we have notes and relationships. So when you say Steven Spielberg, that's a note, that's an entity, right? Jaws is also an entity. And the fact that Steven Spielberg directed Jaws, that's a fact and it's represented with a relationship. That relationship is directed, right? Someone directed a movie that is a, a that, and that's it. That's everything you have on a graph, okay? Basically. Now, the thing is that that was a little bit of a lie because when you have a node, you don't identify it by its name, right? Because uh, guess what? Multiple people could have the same name in the world, right? And that doesn't make them the same person. So uh, actually what we're gonna have is we're gonna have some other thing that identifies the node and the name is an attribute or a property of that node, right? So for instance, name Steven Spielberg, is this a touch screen? Wow, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so the, uh, the node Steven Spielberg has named Steven Spielberg. That's the only property that we gave it to. But uh, the, this node here, the movie Jaws, has a name and also the year on which it was recorded, which is 1975. And then we also have a bunch of different things. Uh, and this is kind of like a tree, but it's not necessarily a tree because basic, a tree does not have cycles. A graph can have cycles, right? So it's more, gener more general. You can represent anything as a graph. Okay, so let's talk about graphs in databases. So if you have this, right, and I tell you to store it in your favorite database, how would you do it? And uh, when you start thinking about this, right, what is your favorite database? Dgraph, of course, but if it's not Dgraph, right? Maybe it's relational database or maybe it's NoSQL. That's basically the two main ones. And then you have all the things like key value store and you have graph databases. So think about relational database. When you think about relational database, probably you're gonna have a table director, a table movie, a table genre, right? Probably that's what you would do. And then for the relations, there's no concept. Relational databases do not have concepts to hold relations, which is kind of weird. They're really bad at doing relations, even though they're called relational. They do tables. That's the only thing they do, right? So if you want to map things, then you start to need to think about, oh, how do you map? If it's a relationship one-to-one, -one, you're going to have uh, you have foreign keys, right? Now, if it's one-to-many, on one side, you can say, I have a relationship, right? So on one side, you could say, JAWS, was there to be Steven Spielberg, so JAWS will have foreign key pointing to Steven Spielberg. But if you do it the other way around and you wanna have uh, the relationship from Steven Spielberg to movies, you cannot really do that. Maybe you have an array or something, but otherwise it's not really a thing, right? And if you have many to many, then you're out of luck. You need to create a new table, right? So let's see how this would be, this would do, right? You could say, oh, I'm gonna, re I'm gonna model these as two tables, movie and director. And the movie has a director, so it has this field, which is the foreign key. Great. Now, if you wanna get all of the movies directed by a director, what you need to do is actually you need to index by this key here. Otherwise, it would be really expensive. You will have to fetch the whole table and then figure out which ones actually have the ID that corresponds to Steven Spielberg. Right, so those unions start to be quite expensive quite quick. Luckily, you have indexes, so that kind of solves the problem, but still you need to defend those. And then I tell you that actually movies do not have one director, right? This movie has four directors. So now your database is broken and you need to fix it. And that's not a thing that it's easy to do, right? 
moving from this to this, that is actually an expensive thing that you're going to need to plan over months if you have a big data set, right? You don't want to lose any of that data. So now what you're doing is you have this new table, movie director, that points to a movie and a director. Cool. What is a movie director? It is not a thing. We had to create it just because the database didn't agree with us, right? So that is extra complexity that you're adding to the model just because the technology doesn't fit what you need, right? What about non relational databases? You know, relational databases, Postgres and everything, they're cool, they're really fast, but they're not powerful enough, they're not expressive enough. So we're gonna use non relational. Uh, does that solve the problem? Well, you could do something like this. So how, how many of you have used MongoDB? Okay, so MongoDB, basically, this is what you would do. You have different kinds of documents. You have a director document, and probably you have a few movies that has all of the, all of the IDs of the movies that they directed. And that's pretty good. And then here you have the name, the year, and all that stuff. Now, how would you do if I told you I want to get the names of all the movies directed by Steven Spielberg? You fetch this, you get that list, and then you fetch this, you fetch this, you fetch this, right? So there's, if n is the number of movies, you need to do n plus one calls. That doesn't scale, right? It, it is a little bit of a problem. So, you know, this is not good enough. No worries, we fix it. We put it everything in one single document. Easy, now it's one call. That scales much better, but, what do you do if you want to get something slightly different or a movie has more than one director? You cannot do that, right? If a movie has more than one director, as we saw it could happen, this doesn't work. So you're out of luck. Okay, well, let's assume that we have this. We re repeat the information. So now if a movie has more than one director, then you would go here, go here and then maybe find the directors and go back and find the other directors. This starts to get more complicated. And the worst part is that now you're repeating information. So now if I say, oh, I'm going to update the information about the movie, you know, uh, Jurassic Park, uh, apparently something in it is wrong and I fix it and I fix it here, but I forget to fix it here. Now you lost the consistency of your database, and at that point, why do you have a database, right? Like the whole point of a database is to help you be consistent. So all of this is, you know, these are things that there's techniques. There are techniques to fix these issues, but still, you need to apply those techniques. You need to think about that. So that's why we have graph databases, right? And in a graph database, what you do is basically, you remember that model that we had with the, the movies, the directors, and all that stuff? That's it. That's what you store, right? So instead of thinking about the different tables or the different documents and stuff, what you have is you have notes and you have relationships. And that's it. So let's think about, let's see about how you do that. How do you do data graph modeling? How do you model your uh, data? How do you model your data to fit in a database, in a graph database? So you have two different things. Uh, according to what we saw in the previous model, then we'll see that actually these two things are the same. You have uh, things like name jaws or year 1975, and that's what we call uh, subject predicate value. Subject is the movie jaws, predicate is name, and value is jaws itself, or jaws was film in 1975. So those are predicates with values and we call them with values because they point to not a node but a string an integer or whatever it is and then you have subject predicate object so for instance when you say uh, the movie jaws was directed by steven spielberg that is two different nodes related by a predicate and that is what we call subject predicate object and it's basically the same to the point that actually the graph stores it exactly the same way there's no difference so uh once we see this, actually, again, here I'm lying, because the name JAWS, we don't store JAWS was directed by Steven Spielberg. What we store is there's an ID, uh, 0x1, we're calling it, that has the name JAWS. That same ID was recorded in 1975. 
that 7 AD was directed by 0x2. That's a different AD. And that is the AD that corresponds to Steven Spielberg. So that Steven Spielberg is 0x2, that has named Steven Spielberg. Right, so actually there's no strings, there's no integers, like it is just IDs related to stuff. And that stuff could be the name, a year, or it could be all the nodes, okay? Cool, so that is how you store the, the data. So given this, a little bit of notation, because this is how we talk about it in uh, DGraph. So all of these numbers, 0x, 1, 0x, you know, all stuff, we call them UIDs, universal identifiers. Has name, was recorded, and all that stuff. Those are predicates. Uh, some people call it edges or relationships, same thing. We call them predicates. And then Jaws, Steven Spielberg on 1975, those are values. Uh, so strings, integers, and all of those things. Those are just called them values. Yeah, every entity has its own UID. Yeah. Yes. Pretty good. So here, this, every node, every circle has its own UID, right? And then attached to that UID, in this case, you're going to have two different predicates, name and year. Those are predicates. No, that, that is a node. And this node, actually, we don't store anything in the node. The node, the only thing that we know about the node is there's a UID. It has an identifier. And everything we attach, we attach to it are like either those properties are predicates that point to a string or an integer, or they're predicates that point to something else being a, another UID. Yeah. Sorry? Do the nodes become the identifiers? The nodes disappear. There's no nodes. There's only UIDs, predicates, and values. Oh, yeah, actually, for later. Okay, uh, cool. Any other questions about how we model the data? Cool. Okay, so did we see this already? No. Okay, so uh, the way we actually store the data is by having the UID and the predicate together, and that's a key. And we store in a key value store, okay? That key value store is something we call Badger, by the way, which is also open source, super cool, and you should give it a try. Uh, so when we say this movie is called Jaws, what we have is somewhere we store the key 0x1 has name. 0x1 is the UID, has name is the predicate, and then the value is Jaws, right? So then 0x2 has name uh, points to Steven Spielberg. Then we also have was recorded in the year 1975, was directed by 0x2. But the idea is that you have UIDs and predicates become a key, and then you have the value. So then this just becomes something that you need to store and uh, access every single time you want to access the value. You just find that key and find whatever we stored, right? So that, that is everything we store, almost. We'll get there. So the question was, how do you traverse the data, the database? And that is the next slide. So we'll get there in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is how we store the data. So now, how do we? Yes. How do you uh, model cycle? So for instance, if you had something like a cycle that was uh friends right like so i i know you you know him and he knows me uh that is uh there is my and i have uid one two and three there will be one saying one knows two two knows three three knows one that's it there's three different key uh uid predicate pairs the, the, that are keys Yeah, yeah, I, I'm gonna try. Throw something at me if I don't. <laughs> okay, cool. So life, uh, let's see the life of a query, right? Like if I send a query, what happens in the database? So uh, the first thing is you're gonna start, you're gonna find in, from what node you're gonna start, right? So let's assume that we know the UID. So it's UID one, it's me, that's it, right? That's where we start. 
That could also be a set. So we could start from multiple nodes at the same time and then do all the paths from there. But let's imagine there's only one. Then I'm gonna say, okay, so who do I know? Okay, so I'm gonna get my ID plus the predicate knows and put those together and that's a key. And I'm gonna look for that key in the key value store. And then I'm gonna get a value, which is all of the people that I know. And then, yeah, so that's the UID predicate pair. I'm gonna look for that, I'm gonna get a value. And then the next step is gonna be, are you done? Or what else do you wanna know? Let's say that I actually want to know all of the names of the people that I know. So once I get the list of the UIDs of the people that I know, from that list, you're gonna append for every UID the predicate name and get that value, right? So, and that's pretty much it. So if you wanna go farther, farther on, you just keep on repeating those steps over and over until you find what was requested. And the good thing is that until you get to the end, right? until the point where you say name, which is a string, before we only work with UIDs, and those are integers, right? So if I say, actually, I don't wanna know the name of my other people I know, I wanna know the names of the people that know the people that I know the people that I know, right? It's just a bunch of integers that we need to do operations on and unions and intersections and whatever, but those are integers. So it's actually very efficient compared to you said we were using the names, uh, the strings themselves, right? So let's say, yeah, uh, let's get the names of the friends of zero x one two three four. This would look something like this: zero x one two three four is friends with someone, and then we're gonna get the has name, whatever name, right? That is the idea of the query. This is not the query language you use, right? This is just an example, so we get it. So we're gonna start by finding the node with UID 0x1234. Then we append is friends with to 0x1234 and we get the value. And then let's say that that gives me 0x ABCD, 0x BCDE, right? So those two are two more UIDs. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna append 0x ABCD to has name and then get a value, Diggy, which is the name of the mascot, by the way. And 0x BCDE has name, Oji. Does anyone know what mascot is RG? Yes, it's a open source project created by Rob Pike. It's like a weird bird, uh, not important. But uh, so we get that and then that's it. Now we, we got the zero X ABCD has name. We got the value Digi and the value RG and that's the result. Okay, so that is the whole process. Any questions about this part? Use the mic. If it doesn't work, just I'll repeat the question. Just, no, just, Hello. oh yeah. Nice. Okay, um, so how do we add the predicates to the UIs? What is the operation? Concatenation, literally. It's just that like you put them together. Just concatenate. Yeah, with a separator and everything so you can figure out what is the UID and what is the predicate, but that's it. It just like literally just put them both together and that's the key that you're gonna look for the in the uh, key value store. Key value pair. Yeah. But uh, how do we know which predicate to add? Because one UID, as you mentioned, might, might have multiple predicates. Yes, we know the predicate by its name. So the name is friends with, that is the predicate is friends with. So when I say, oh, find me the people that, 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 I, that I'm friends with, that's what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for that string attached to, so, Starting 0x1234, followed by is friends with. If we find that, it means that I'm friends with someone. If we do not find it, it means that I'm not friends with anyone. That's it. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's the. Hello. So in real life, uh, what if uh, the query is something like, give me all the names of the friends of uh, Rob. Yeah. So here we have to go back, like I have to find. Yes, the we'll get there in a second. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, uh, earlier example, you have uh, names of a movie and names of a director. Yeah. So there are two contexts to that. So has name, 
will return so is there a uh, saving context because we can do has movie name or has but in that case has name won't return anything so we have to re- uh, add two different set of thing or can we no. add some kind of context name is one predicate no matter what node or type you're thinking about so whether it's a movie or a director they both have names so we'll store it exactly the same way there's no way to well there's some ways but the way we store it there's no difference in between uh 0x1 name steven spielberg 0x2 name jaws they look exactly the same yeah in case we want to find all the movie names or like uh, so in that is like just having we'll get there yeah uh so yeah we return the and rg was what the strings that we're looking for okay so uh the question that uh he was asking about is sure 0x1234 it's great but what if i'm actually looking for the friends of rob right who's rob we first need to find them that person so the way that works is actually uh so we name rg or whatever there's a lot of different ways of finding what are the those first nodes that we're going to be working with right we don't always know the uids it's not a fair thing to expect people to know the uids of the database we need to be able to find them somehow and for that what we do is we use indices so we can build indexes in a bunch of different things so for instance we have indexes on strings so in this case we could search for exactly the same name right exactly rob so it needs to be called rob otherwise we'll not find it up to you know even exactly the same casing capital r otherwise it doesn't work that's exact um if you want to store something smaller you can also store the hash and it allows you to do the same things except for when you have exact you can actually sort the strings because you have the previous value but if you have the hash you lost that so you cannot even sort them you cannot say something that you know it's bigger than a smaller than b that you need exact hash will not be enough then we also have term so if say frances campoy that's my name so uh would separate it into two parts they you could be able to find me by francesc or campoy and it would actually lower case it so it's easier to find full text is uh basically like elastic search so it does smart things like if you say running it will actually get the root for that word so it will say run instead of running so you, you can search then ran and ran is the past of run so we still find it right so nat- a little bit more sm- smarter smarter uh, index creating for natural languages uh then we have trigram that allows you to do regular expressions so you can search by prefix or whatever you're looking for uh then we have date time by year month date hour um in float and bool have just their index there's nothing fancy there and then geo properties uh, will allow you to find things by the location so we also we also support that so uh in order to create an index you need to first say that this uh that you create an index on a on a predicate right so i'm going to create an index on name or i'm going to create an index on year of recording right uh but before you can do that you actually need to declare those predicates the thing is that you don't really need to declare anything on the graph initially you can just put data there and then later on start modifying the schema right so uh here for instance you would say name the type string and then at index and all of the kind of indexes that you want to have so if i want to have index on the on the recording year i will have recording year uh int but let's say it's an int at index int dot that's it that's how you write it and we'll see this in a minute actually like in real uh real life demo so let's update that the life of a query rather than using the uids also you could use an index right so instead of saying find me all of the friends find me all of the names all of the friends of 0x1 you could say find the names of all of the friends of someone named rob okay so you can also do that thanks to indexes cool any questions up to here oh we have a Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have a few questions here. Instead of considering it, does it actually use a document like thing where you have a key of 0x1234 and value of whatever predicate 
predicate name instead of having a separator between them? Uh, so we do not store a document. We do not store like a JSON document. We actually just store, so if you have a person has name, age, and location, that will be three different predicates. And they're, set, they're stored separately. So if then you want to fetch all of those things, you need to say, I want to fetch the three things. But also you could fetch only one. So basically it makes it so, you know, uh, ha has anyone used GraphQL? Okay, so the whole point of GraphQL is the fact that you say exactly what you want, right? So instead of having to do it by filtering a big JSON document and removing the things we don't want, actually we do it the, the, way, the other way around. We build that data that you're asking for uh, as we're part, we are uh, traversing the graph. And the second question, how do you define predicates? Is it is friends with predefined or is it defined as a part of schema? Or is there as a concept of schema? So it is part of the schema, but you do not need to define it initially. You, if you send... So if you send some data and I say 0x1 name Francesc, that will define if it didn't exist, it will add the predicate name of type string on the schema itself. So we'll, we'll see that in, in a live demo in a minute. Okay. How do you handle same predicator multiple times, like multiple movie director for a single movie? So uh, uh, what we store in the value Actually, there was an example. Oh, it died. Okay. Uh, why did it die? Okay, so... Yeah, so here we have an example. Uh, 0x1234 is friends with two different things. So actually, you can have multiple values. That value can be a list. And that's actually what we call a, po a posting list. So basically, instead of having many times the same uh, uh, UID predicate that will actually repeat very often with all of the values. We just have it once and the value is the list of all of the things that we're related to. That's it. Thank you. Uh, yes. So how do you find all the people who have more than five friends? Do you uh, have on that? Yeah, so you can do that. I will do it in, in live demos. But yeah, uh, ask me the question once we're doing the live demo. I'm happy to show. Uh, I I have a question as well. Uh, so, how do you? So, uh, as you mentioned, right? It's a key value store that you use underlying. And then, yeah. how do you power uh, search use cases or match and names? Because in key value stores, how like you would have to keep something else then. Sorry, say that again. So, since it's a key value store, how yeah. do you power use cases of search? Because in key value, you can just do lookups based on IDs. indexes. So the index is basically going to use also the key value store. But for instance, for the index, uh, if I'm creating an index term on my name, Francesc Campoy Flores, that would actually create three different keys, Francesc, Campoy, and Flores, and they would all point to my UID. So then there would be, uh, there could be X number of indexes that you could keep. Is there such limitations that you have? There's no limitation. You can create as many. I mean, there's limitations of how big your hard disk is. But, so, you know. so, so does it have memory impact or it's stored in disk? I'm not sure about that one, actually. The boss. <laughs> uh, it's all stored in disk on Badger. And Badger itself is optimized so that um, it will use like not that much memory. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. OK, so let's continue. Uh, yeah, that's enough. OK, so now we're going to be talking. Now that we know how we store the data, how do we actually you know, make the thing run? Uh, we, we don't have just one single server. We have actually many. Uh, the whole point being that if you have only one server and that server crashes, you don't have a database anymore. But if you have many servers and one of them crashes, you just have a database that is a little bit not as fast or not as powerful as before, but you have the time to restart the, other, the, the server that crashed and keep on serving traffic, right? That redundancy basically gives you a robustness. So we have three kinds of uh, nodes. And actually, there's only two in the database. We have this one extra that we call Rattle or Rattle or Rattel, depending on where you're from, apparently. Uh, so I call it Rattle. Uh, and this is a web UI. So this is the playground where you can write your code, like write your queries and see the result and all that stuff. And I'm going to be using that uh, for the live demo. And then we have alphas and zeros. And you can have many alphas, and you can have many zeros, right? Uh, so 
in a very, very high level point of view, alphas store data and zeros manage the database itself at a very high level of abstraction. That's pretty much what they do. So uh, zeros are called zeros because they actually use, so everything here, since you, have, you can have multiple uh, servers performing the same tasks for, like, for anything like cluster management, you could only have one if you wanted to, but you can, only, you can also have three, which helps with the fact that if you lose one, it still works. But if you have three, which one is the one that is right, right? So that's a little bit of a problem. And we use Raft, a consensus algorithm, to decide on that. So uh, when we talk about groups, we're talking about Raft consensus groups. So zero is the Raft consensus group zero that manages all of the information about uh, the cluster itself. So for all of the servers, what are their roles? Uh, how do we talk to one or the other and all that stuff? Uh, that's where this is going to be stored in the zeros. Uh, you need to have at least one, and you can have normally you can have three or five. That's normally it's going to be three. That's more than enough because if one dies, you still have two. They're going to be able to keep working while the uh, the one that died restarts. And uh, then we have alphas and alphas. I don't know what they're called alphas because if the other one is zeros, they should be ones, but they're called alphas. Uh, and these serve the groups one and on, okay? And these are actually storing the data. So what we do is uh, we, we could have only one extra group, the, the group one, and store all of our data in there, right? So then all of the nodes in that group, they're gonna be storing the same data. They're replicating the whole data set. But if one dies, you know, you're still keeping the data. And also, the more of the nodes you have, the faster you can answer the request, the more load you can handle, okay? But what happens if all of the data you have doesn't fit in a single machine? What you're gonna do is you're gonna have multiple replica groups. So that's why we have group one or two or three. Most of the time, you're gonna see only one group because actually you can store a lot of data in there, but if you needed more, that's how you would shard the things. And the way we shard the data is by predicate. So let's say we have only two predicates, name and age, and they're all so big that they do not fit in a single machine. Probably you have group one serving all of the data for the predicate name, group two serving all the data for the predicate age. Okay, cool. We're hiring. <laughs> okay, and then Rattle, which is the web UI, and uh, it is very useful for, for data exploration to the point that I've heard uh, some of our customers saying that they dump uh, JSON data into this and then they explore it, right? You don't need to do anything else. You just dump JSON data and now you see it as a graph, you can navigate it, it's pretty cool. So yeah, Rattle, alphas and zeros. Rattle or any client is going to send the queries to alphas and alphas are gonna talk to other alphas if they do not have the data that they need to, to, uh, to answer the, the response. And also they're gonna be talking to zeros to figure out what they're supposed to do. Okay, and zeros also talk to each other and manage the cluster. Cool, any questions about this part? Yeah. Yeah, uh, all this alphas and zeros would be residing in one machine or machines each you could run it all of this in a single machine but then if that machine crashes you lost the database which is sad uh, so normally what you're gonna do is each one of these will be running a different machine but also you could have all of these in only three machines and then have kubernetes and let kubernetes decide what runs where so that's that's up to you in, in uh, my demo I'm gonna be running gonna be running everything in a single machine which is not a great idea, but for demos is good enough. I cannot hear you, sorry. If, oh, it's fine. Yeah, so my, like data is, uh, my data is distributed in multiple alpha. So my data will talk to one alpha or it talks to multiple alpha? Talks to any of the alpha, any alpha. You can no. talk to any of the, just no, one. Any alpha, but yeah. it always talks to one alpha, right? That's up to you. You can choose which one you talk to. Any of the alphas will answer any of the queries. No, but they will be that, able to, if they don't have, if, if this if one. they don't have the data. So if this one doesn't have the data, 
this one will send a query to the one that has the data and then we'll send you the data. So it will act as a proxy. So okay. you don't need to think about what you should talk to. You should talk to any alpha and they will have the data. Uh, uh, hey, this is Karan. I work at Gojek. We are potentially looking at using dgraph cool. internally. So how well uh, does dgraph handle latency between nodes? Like, could I potentially put nodes in different regions? Yeah, you, you can. Uh, the only thing is, depending on how you're going to be running it, like eventually you could have transactions being a little bit slower because in order to achieve a transaction, I'm not going to get into the details of that because that's complicated. But uh, if the nodes that need to decide on anything, they need to talk to each other and they're really far, the latency can add a little bit. But in general, you can actually do that totally fine. Yeah. Because very often when you're going to be talking to an alpha, you can actually have replicas for the alpha storing the data in your own region. So that will be quite fast. Transactions require uh, talking to more machines. So that can be a little bit more complicated. But we can talk more in detail. Actually, it's yeah, probably I'll good. take the rest of the questions. So. Okay. Yeah. We can talk about that in the Q&A, actually. Okay. Yes. Last question. So uh, one thing before you can keep the questions relevant to what I just explained. For general questions, we'll have a Q&A section at the end. So who handles a uh, locking mechanism? Is it alpha or zero? Who handles? A uh, locking mechanism for transactions. Transactions. We'll talk about that at the end. Yeah, because that's yesterday. Was it yesterday or two days ago? We spent like three hours talking about that. So yeah. Any other questions about this part? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, zero looks like me. Uh, it behaves like a service discovery, like console, because it has a raft consensus protocol and you yeah. have quorum. So why you need, like do why you didn't adapt whatever is whatever is there in the market like console? As a because service that would mean that then you need to run also a console. Okay, this Instead is part of, part of your product itself or you are running as a service? This is the yeah. graph. Okay. This part here. This is something that we run on top. This is optional, but this is the database. Okay, and uh, who decide how many replica of data I have to store and uh, where? You decide it. You can, you can start with saying, uh, I'm going to have one replica per group, and that's all. So fine. that you is can... part of the graph configuration? Yes. Yeah, okay. and I didn't get a chance to ask question on the starting slide. Yeah. So suppose if I compare with Neo4j, so there we create a node, we give a node name, basically a table name, suppose, and then we define a schema that this table name, suppose movie, it will have a movie name, then which year and all. Then yes. you have a director node which has some attributes then you add constraint on that node like duplicate entries will not be there you should not allow this we can talk about that at the end we're gonna have q and a's that's uh again, neo 4 j things we're gonna talk at the end happy to do so uh we do not have constraints on on this uh right, right. That's right. yeah we we just store predicates and at the at the end of this slide i'm actually going to be talking about types which is somehow similar to the node type known names it's a little bit different. We'll talk about that. Okay, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, one more. <laughs> so uh, the question was, if, if I send this, uh, I'm asking about the data about age, right? And this one only stores name. Uh, age is stored by this one. How does this one know where to ask? Zeros will tell them. Zeros know who handles what. And they let alphas know all of the time. It's like, this is, this is what the cluster looks like, right? So when the alpha needs to talk to someone, already knows who to talk to without talking to the zero. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to cut it, like, I mean, people can ask, actually ask the questions at the end uh, rather than cutting the flow. And also, unless it is really pressing, like, keep it at the end, and then you can discuss for more time. And also, during the break time, both of them will be available. So yeah, we have discuss more uh, than short answers. Yeah, for, for like, if, if there are relevant questions to what it's on the slide, go for it. If not, we can keep it to the end. Cool. So conclusion, conclusion, it's not necessary. We already just saw this. So let's talk about GraphQL plus minors, which is the query language that we use. So uh, it's inspired by GraphQL. So if you've ever used GraphQL, it will look quite similar, but it's not exactly the same because GraphQL is not expressive enough to express the things we need to for, graph, for databases, right? So it has a little bit extra things, but also there's some things of GraphQL that do not make sense for a database. So it also has 
things that are missing. And that's why, that's why it's called plus minus, because you have some extra things and some missing things. Uh, GraphQL support is actually coming up soon. Uh, already, I can show a demo later if you're interested. It's already kind of working. Uh, and also, if you want to try it out, uh, you can go to play.digraph.io. That is an instance of Rattle that runs on the cloud. That way you can try it out. It doesn't allow you to mutate the data because that'd be dangerous. So it's, only, it's read only. But uh, otherwise, it's a very nice way to get started. So how do you store data? So you store data uh, with mutations. So a mutation looks like this. And here what I'm saying is I'm going to store uh, something attached to a UID. This is not a UID. This is what we call a blank UID. And basically, this is a holder for UID, right? I'm saying something that I'm calling for now Alice, but you know that is not a UID. UIDs are numbers. Uh, has a predicate name, and it's attached to Alice, the string Alice. Okay, and then a dot because these are end quotes, and that's how the format works. So you need to put that dot at the end, and I always forget. But you need to put it, otherwise it doesn't parse. Okay, so here, if you do that, you're storing the data for Alice. Cool. Then you're gonna get a response, and one of the things you're gonna get is this here. That's basically telling you, oh, the node that you called Alice, that UID that you said Alice, it's actually now zero x one. That it's a it's real UID. Okay. So now next time, if you want to ask for Alice, what you can do is say node zero x one. Why do we have those? Uh, blank holders, right? Like those blank UIDs, because that way you can repeat the same one and all of those things will attach to the same UID. So here I'm saying, whatever UID that I still don't know about, I'm going to name it Bob, has the name Bob, and the same UID knows the uh, whatever UID is 0x1. Okay, so now we have around that, now create a Bob 0x2. Okay, so that's why we have blank UIDs. So you can create multiple, you can attach multiple predicates to one single uh, UID at the same time. So with that, we created this. We create 0x1, 0x2. We said 0x1 has named Alice, 0x2 has named Bob, and 0x1 knows, 0, 0x2 knows 0x1. That's the graph that we created with those two mutations. So let me do this as a live demo if I'm able to, because we brought the table here for that. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna run the database. So in order to run the database, there's many ways, but uh, I can dgraphql zero, that will start one zero, dgraphql alpha, that will start one alpha. So actually I think I messed that up. No, okay, working. And then I'm gonna use rattle connected to local host. And I'm gonna send those mutations. So I'm gonna say, said, uh, I'm gonna say Alice, let me make it a little bit bigger, name Alice, Bob, ooh, Chinese, no, uh, uh, Bob, name Bob, that is a Chinese dot two, that's not gonna work, and uh, Bob knows Alice. So this is creating the same uh, graph as before, okay? So let's run that. That worked and it created Alice and Bob. So now if you go to the schema, you will see that this has been created directly, right? I didn't say anything. This, this, I just started this database, it was completely empty. So now we know that there's predicate name of type default uh, because we don't know, know what type it is. It says string, but actually you could put anything else in there. So it just says default. And then knows is of a list of UIDs because you can know many people. Cool. So actually, this is probably not what we want. So let's say, oh no, this is actually a string. And now, okay, cool. So we can do queries like this. Uh, we can say, oh, with the UID 0x1 and 0x2, give me the names attached to it. So let's do that. The query. UID 0x1, 0x2, uh, UID and name around this, and it gives me the data in a JSON format, right? So uh, this is basically almost GraphQL, and this is uh, the result. Cool. 
So you can also do nose, UID, and name. So now what I'm doing is, okay, so uh, get the UID and name for each one of these people, and also go find all of the people that they know, and also give me their UID and their name, okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, mm, no. <laughs> It doesn't. Okay, that's the biggest I can do. Um, cool, so if I run this, oh, actually I run it already. So you can see 0x1, Bob, Nose, 0x2, Alice, right? So now we're able to fetch that data and going a little bit deeper. The cool thing is you can also get the graph and you see Alice and Bob and how they know each other. So they're connected. There's a, yeah, you can actually set an arrow, right? So this is the basics of how you store data and how you fetch it. Now, the next thing is gonna be, you know, uh, I want to actually get only the information for Bob, but I do not know what is the UID for Bob, right? So I'm gonna use an index. So I can do a filter by equal name Bob. Okay, that's how you say, find all of the nodes that have name Bob. And if I run this, it will say, nope, you cannot do that because the attribute, attribute name is not indexed. So let's add an index. You go here, say index, and you can choose a bunch of different ones. Since I'm actually looking uh, exactly by the name, you can just go with exact. And then I need to go smaller and click update and then go bigger again. <laughs> cool, so now if we run this, not that. <laughs> Now we have the same information, right? But now we didn't know that Bob had the UID 0x1. We actually found it through the index. Let me show the query again. Cool. So that's already all of the slides. <laughs> you can create as many indexes as you want on as many fields as you want. What the data types in this? Uh, on the that you need to first say what type it is. So if it's just uni default, cannot, you cannot create indexes on default, but you can create, if you want, if you know this is a string, you can say, oh, this is a string, I create index on string, and then you can choose which time you want. The more, you the more indexes you create, the more data you're gonna have to store. So the idea is create only the indexes that you need. Yeah. No, but, but if I create multiple indexes, then it will be like, search will be faster, right? Stuff will be faster, but then stuff will be bigger. So eventually it doesn't fit, right? So there's a trade-off in between how many, like only use the indexes that you actually need okay. because you could create an index. So for instance, for the trigram for regular expressions, that's gonna be quite big, right? That's gonna store a decent amount of information. If you're not using it, why are you storing it? And also it will be faster to fetch, but when you put in the information, you actually still need to update those indexes. So there's a trade-off, you need to be careful and only create the indexes that you need. Wait, oh, here. Sorry. Yeah, you go. Uh, can you go back to the demo once? I just want to ask. So when you showed the first demo, you had that UID keyword in there uh, after func, right? Yeah, UID is a function too. So you can, instead of equals, that is a function that allows me to find all of the nodes, all of the UIDs that have a predicate of type, of a predicate that has the value Bob. You can also use UID that will return all of the UIDs that you gave it to. So UID 0x1, that would be, so here, this 0x1, right? So this equals name buff would be exactly, it would return exactly the same thing as this. But here, I, you need to know the UID. In the other one, you're using indexes, so you don't need to. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, how do you deal with uh, deep traversals? So if you have no- We'll get there. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yes, so types. This is something that was added actually in the latest release, B1.1.0 that was released like yesterday, uh, like two or three days ago. Um, and uh, the idea is that the same way you can attach uh, predicates like name and nose and other things to any node, you can also attach a specific predicate that it's called digraph.type. And then basically what you're saying is this node is of type person. 
for instance. And then that's enough. If you want to, that's enough. Then from there, without defining anything else, you can start saying, give me all of the nodes of type person. And that will work. But also you can say, what are the fields instead of a person? And then extra things will unlock, okay? So you can start from just saying, this is a person. You can go a little bit deeper. So yes, so that's enough for now. Uh, this is how you define a type. This is a type person uh, that has a name string. It knows it's a list of UIDs. These actually, these two correspond to actual uh, predicates, right? So name is a predicate, nodes is a predicate. And then you can fetch them by saying, instead of equals or UID, you can say type person. And that will give you all of the UIDs of the nodes attached to the type person. And that's pretty much it for step zero. So let's actually do that in the live demo. So what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna do, without doing anything else, right? Like I'm not defining anything yet. I'm gonna do 0x1 dgraph.type person and 0x2, actually I think you need to do this so it parses, 0x2, thank you, dgraph type person. So now by doing this, I'm just saying, hey, these two nodes are of type person. Okay, that, that's it. I have not defined what person is yet. But even with just this, which is literally labeling, now I can go here and do, give me all of the names, let's just do the only name, uh, of type person. And now it's giving me Bob and Alice because those are, pe those are persons, okay? So this is like the basic, basic level. And this already is super useful. And this is actually what I used for most of the things that you're gonna see later in the live demo. Uh, but if you wanted to do more, there's a cool thing called expand. And expand, what it does is it will find what are the predicates associated to this node according to its type and just expand that, okay? So let's do that. I'm gonna expand, oh. And if you do this, you get nothing. Why? Because we have not said anything about the type person. We have not defined it yet. So let's create the type. So types at type person. And let's say it has both predicates and create type. Cool. So now person is a type that is not just a label. We actually know stuff about it. So when you run this query, you're gonna see Bob and Alice. Someone might wonder, why is nose not there? And the thing is that nose is not there because if you write, basically this is like writing this. Expand all, basically it becomes this. If you run this, you get nothing. Why? Because there's nothing inside of that. Nose points to something, but you're not asking for UID, no name or anything, so then it doesn't return anything. So you can do UID and I works, or let's do name. Or you could also do this, which is kind of cool. Expand all, and then expand all inside. And that doesn't work because I did something weird. Repeated subgraph, oh yeah, because name is already there. So you cannot repeat fields multiple times. So since name is already there, it complains. Cool, so now it actually tells me that Bob knows Alice. Cool, and this is because we define types. But again, you do not need to define types, but they're helpful for specific things. Cool, and I think that's enough for types. Uh, I'm gonna show you this really quick. Uh, when on my live demo, the way I assigned types was, eh, you know, like this works, but you would not do this in production, right? Like getting UID by UID and writing them. So there's actually an interesting thing to do, which is, you know, find all of the, find all of the nodes that have the predicate name, for instance, and say that all of those are people, they're person, right? So that is what an absurd does. So an absurd, you would say an absurd, whoops, uh, query everything that has a name and put it in this variable people, and then set all of those UIDs to dgraph type person. So this will get 
all of the nodes that have names and say those are now of type person. So then for the rest, you can keep on working with those. Okay. These are a little bit more advanced, but I thought it was kind of cool to show. So cool. And there's much more. And there's actually a pretty long live demo, but I don't know if I should be doing it now. Yeah. Okay, cool. So on the demo now, we're going to see a bunch of other things that you can do with the database. And also we're going to see Pokemon. Yay. Uh, all of the code for this is uh, there on github.com slash campo slash pokergraph. Uh, it's open source. The data that it uses is also open source. So you can, it's actually not open source because I forgot to put a license, but I put a license and then it'll be open source. Uh, so this is the data. Uh, it comes from Poke API, which is a REST API. So uh, instead of using the REST API, I just got the, the GitHub repository holding all the JSON files. And I use that because it's much faster, especially in India especially in a hotel in India. <laughs> so, uh, cool. Uh, so yeah, we're still hiring. Uh, so let's go with this. So I have this instance running Docker and it's running, you don't need to see much, but it's running an alpha, a zero and rattle. So it's running these three, uh, these three things in one single instance of Google Cloud Platform, okay? So I can connect to it by doing this one. Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to need actually one second. My notebook. Uh, oh yeah, that's it. Cool. So this data has, there's a lot of things in, in, this, in this data set. Actually includes all of the Pokemon in the world, the eggs, the type, the color, the gender, the uh, attacks, the, like all of the things that you can imagine of a Pokemon is in here, right? So there's a lot of data. Uh, we're going to be playing with the basic things, but then you can run it yourselves. Uh, it's literally just one command. Run the whole thing and play with the data set yourselves. So the first thing we're going to do is find Pikachu because I like Pikachu. So we're going to do it by doing uh, equals name Pikachu and give me the name and the UID. Uh, Pikachu lowercase, Pikachu, cool. And there's three Pikachus. Um, why is this? Well, let's see a little bit more. What are the types? All right, so there's actually three different ones. Let's see, let's render them. This one is Pokemon form. This one is Pokemon species. And this one is a Pokemon. Because guess what? Pikachu is of the species Pikachu on the form Pikachu. So that's why you see three times. They're different things. They all have the same name, right? So the same idea of here types actually help you identify a little bit because they all have a name and the names are all the same. So now uh, we have one question. Yes. Is the type a slice? Yes, you can have as many types as you want. So at, for instance, you could create, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg, he's a person, yes, but he is also a director and he's also an actor and okay. he's probably also other things, right? So you can have many types of shared with one and use the type that you care about in depending on the context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool, so since they have types, we can go see, and actually this is kind of cool. Um, let me see on the, this repository, if you go to type dev, this program, which is also written in Go, which is good because it's, it's a Go meetup. Uh, this uses Digo, which is our Go client for dgraph. And what it does is it fetches, so fetches all of the predicates from the schema fetches all of the types that I have designed, defined, and then what it does, it matches them together and it generates a schema for you. So you can run this on any database, on any DGraph instance, and it will work. Uh, when you generate, when you run it, it generates something like, uh, no, uh, types of schema. So it generates something like this, 
with all of the different types and the, uh, and the predicate. So I use this program to generate the schema from scratch. And that way I'm able to do things like expand. So on the query, we can go now and say expand off. And that's pretty useless. Uh, so if you see the JSON result, it actually added a bunch of things, right? Uh, it added the way, the location, whatever, the name that is default. So it added a lot of things, but there's no re extra relationships. Why? Well, because actually, if you want the relationship, not only you need to write the nose, but also somewhere, something inside. Otherwise, nothing works. So you can do expand or again. That's going to give you more information. And the graph, all of a sudden, starts to be more interesting. So now you can see that Pikachu lives in the forest. There is a quadruped that likes the ground. It's of, uh, let's see, it's a species Pikachu, which is of color blue, red blue for some reason. Oh no, red blue is the game. But all of these things, you see, like you start generating all of these things quite easily. There is a cool way of doing this too, which is recurse. So if you do def one, you're gonna get the first one that we had. Def two is expand all with an expand all inside. And I'm gonna do three, but no more than that, because this starts to be quite big. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's expand all the things. Okay. So this is all the information uh, connected to Pikachu at like two levels. So this starts to be a lot of data. So uh, dgraph's totally fine with that. Chrome though, not that much. So <laughs> that's a little bit the problem. Uh, cool. So Let's do something else. Let's actually use the types and say, in, P in Pokemon, there's genders. So let's see what are the genders. Uh, I did something weird. Oh, yeah. Uh, there you go. So there's three genders, male, female, and genderless. Cool. So from there, let's find, uh, let's see. So genders actually. They have a Pokemon species details. That is a list of species that have the, that gender. And then there's extra information in there, Pokemon species and name. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to expand the whole thing. It's probably a bad idea, but too late. I cannot zoom out enough. There you go. Yeah, that's already full screen. Let's see. OK, so you can see this is male. That's female. Those are the species that are only female. Those are the species that are only male. These are the species that have two genders. And then these are the species that are genderless. So for instance, uh, what's the name of this one? As elves are genderless, uh, this is, this one here is, oh, I forgot to put name on the gender. So let's do name two. Uh, you need to give it a minute. I think it will eventually get there. There is actually a lot of data, and I think that this is uh, D3JS. You can see the genderless already separated, and male and female are separating little by little, and the ones in the middle will sit there. Uh, this is going to take forever because my computer is doing too much stuff right now. But uh, with these, you can already start seeing a lot of things that, you know, if I just give you all the JSON files, finding this out would be very, very hard to do, right? Um, let's find, for instance, uh, you do not so the question was, how do you specify the node color? Uh, it actually uses just uh, the edges for now. Eventually, we'll use types. But right now, the, the blue ones are the ones that you got from the, from the type gender. Then the ones that are connected to it, which are the species uh, details, are in green. And the species themselves are in pink. But you don't get to choose that. Uh, it's also, you can change it if you want to. Like, you can create your own visualization. At the end, it's just visualizing this really large JSON file. 
So these all JSONs all there, so you can visualize it. Uh, something that we could do that probably, let me remove that because it's getting annoying. Go away. Okay. Uh, so let's do a little bit different. Instead of getting all of the data, there's a lot of data. Let's just count uh, how many uh, how many species per gender we have. So we can do it count. So on the graph, we're not gonna be much, but here we can see that there are 684 female, 676 male, and 104 genderless. So with this, you can have a little bit of an idea, but still the thing is that if you add all of them, it's more than the kind of species we have because some of them are both male and female. So that's why a little bit. Okay, let's do another one. So this one is gonna be, we're gonna go with all of the Pokemon. We're gonna find all of their types. And for every type, we're gonna get the name. And types are like things like fairy and flying and things like that. So for instance, actually get, let's get the name of the Pokemon too. And the name of the, yeah, that's enough. So gloom is top of that grass, etc. We can render that. Render, 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 more, more, more. And this eventually will create something that is kind of hard to see, but all of the blue ones are Pokemon. All of the pink ones are the types. So you can start to see them, how they group to each other and all that stuff. But uh, let's say that, you know, what this is showing me is that this is messy data set, right? There's a lot of things going on in there. So let's say that I want to find all of the ones that, you know, they only have one type, right? I want a beautiful graph and the, that beautiful graph, they cannot have too many edges. So I want to get only the Pokemon that are of a single type. So you could do this by doing, uh, wait a second, uh, types, yeah. So we can do filter by count of types is one. And I'm sure I'm missing parentheses. Uh, filter, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, that was good. So now these are all of the Pokemon that only have one type. So this should render much better. So yeah, these are all of the Pokemon of a single type. So the things in the middle, those uh, pink ones will be the type. So this type water and you have seeking and all that stuff. Uh, so that is, those are filters, right? And you can apply filters in at any level. But here we're filtering at the top level, counting all the types and just getting the ones that have count of types equals one. You could also do gradient then and just get the ones that have a lot of types. Uh, something that'd be interesting is how many of them have two types, for instance. And I trained I'm not gonna render that and just gonna get the JSON. And now you're gonna see that all of them, they tell you the two types there are, right? So for instance, gloom is both grass and poison. Cool. The next question is, what if I want to find all of the ones that are both, say, grass and poison, right? That starts to be a little more complicated. And it actually requires a, another directive that we have. So let's say we're gonna start here. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, so let's say grass. So I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna call it grass. I'm gonna filter the types by those that have name grass. Okay, so that should return a bunch of things that have grass. Uh, cool, and some others that do not have grass, right? So grammar is not of type grass. Okay, but we're gonna keep it like that for now. The interesting thing, is that you can actually say, you know what? If, the, if anything in there is empty, just remove it. And if something has something empty, remove it too. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna be removing the elements that have something empty and we're gonna keep on going up with that. And that is called cascade. If you do that, now you're gonna get only the ones that are of type grass. 
So you're gonna see only type grass in the center and all of the Pokemon going around. So now if you wanna say grass and poison, you, do this, you, you can do the same thing. So copy, paste, poison, poison. And these are the Pokemon that are both of type grass and poison, right? So you can actually combine things by using Cascade. And you basically like what you would do in SQL with N and stuff like that, you can use it thanks to Cascade. Let's see, uh, what am I? When I don't sleep enough, I don't write very clearly, so I have no idea what I wrote there. Uh, just, uh, Oh yeah, so if you wanted to get the count, uh, nah, that's not interesting. I think this is probably enough. We saw, we're hiring. Uh, filters cascade, oh, normalize. Uh, so let's say, whoops. Uh, let's say that I wanted to get uh, something similar to this, but I wanna get the, the, te the type name. And right now, so we're gonna just remove all of this, go to the basic one. Okay, so if you run this, you're getting on the JSON, this extra structure that is, this is because of how the data is modeling the graph, right? So you have uh, the name, the Pokemon with the name Gloom has many types. One of them has the, the name Grass. Cool, but I actually do not care about this level. So I wanna break it into like just a list. And that's actually what we call normalize. So if you do, Normalize, you get nothing. Uh, because what happens when you do normalize is only the ones that you assign a name to specifically are the ones that are gonna be kept. Everything else is removed. So you can actually use the same one. So let, actually let's call it Pokemon name and type name. And now what it's doing is just generating a list of objects for all of the things that match in just one list with a bunch of different objects. So when you're parsing something, probably you want this when you're the client rather than that big graph that you need to recurse inside. So with that, we have uh, normalize, recurse, cascade, and filters. So we've seen all of the ones that I wanted to show you. Uh, reverse edges are actually kind of cool. Uh, so Let's say that I want to get, I want to start from Pokemon type, Pokemon type, and I want to get all of the types of the type in the name. So basically I'm doing the same thing as before, but in the opposite order, right? Instead of starting from Pokemon and getting all the tags and then going over, uh, again, you can actually go backwards in the same predicate by doing tilde. Now, if you run that, it will say, oh, it actually, oh, it works because I actually defined that already. Uh, but uh, basically the way you're gonna do that is underscore types, types. Oh no, that should not have worked. I did, oh, because Pokemon type is not a type. What is the name of the type? Uh, Pokemon, oh no, it's type type, okay. Uh, uh, exit, exit, uh, there you go. So it's actually of type type. And then we're gonna try to go back. Okay, and now it says you cannot go back because the predicate tab doesn't have reverse edge. So that, you know, to fix it, you go here, you find type. Type is here, click reverse, click on update. And we're gonna also do the same with types. Click reverse, click on update, go to the console, run the query. Sorry, what? I, what? For the reverse heads. Say that again. But the data type we have to change for the reverse heads. The data type stays 
I don't understand the question. Oh, if you not necessarily, if you if you were using expand, yes. But if you know exactly what is the predicate that you want to use, you can just use it. Types are optional, right? So these here, I'm using type only to find the initial values. Then I'm, tra I'm traversing by using this. And I think there's something wrong in it, but it's fine, I guess. Um, actually, types UAD. Okay, so that, that one worked. This one didn't. Because types, it's not called types, it's actually called something else, and I forgot what it is. But uh, that's enough. We can actually do name there. There's no name either. Yes, so these are the types that you have for different types. What is the generation that they appear? So for type, fire, physics, psychic, and everything, basically now what we're doing is the same query as before. But instead of starting from the Pokemon and going forward, we're starting from the type and going backwards. And you can do that too. But for that, you need to say that the reverse edge exists. And that will also generate extra things in the, data, in the database, of course. So only use that when you need it. Use the mic, please. Thank you. You are creating bidirectional graph by just. Uh... It is not a bidirectional edge, because uh, I, I would call it bidirectional if you didn't have to use the tilde, uh, this has a direction. It goes in one way. And by tilde, you're just traversing it backwards. So it's not really bidirectional. It is just that you can, you know, there's a direction, there are directed edges that you can traverse backwards, which is almost the same. It just conceptually is different. And I want to add bidirectional, actual bidirectional edges eventually. So that's why I'm saying, no, it is not the same thing. That's a feature request. Cool. So I think that's enough, <laughs> uh, enough Pokemon for today. Uh, so yeah, so if you want to play with this, um, github.com slash tempo slash pokergraph, I will put the slides online. I'll send them to the organizer so they can share them with all of you. Um, if you want to play with the API itself and find cool things without having to use dgraph, you can also do it, POC API. Again, we're hiring. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions now or you want to just go with the next talk. You need to use the mic, otherwise I don't hear you. Yeah, all three are running only three Docker instance. All, yeah, this is running. Um, so it was here. No, not there. Not there. Here. Uh, so and it's running. The, yeah, how much the data size? Dgraph, dgraph, dgraph. So it's three times the same image. But the first one is running alpha, second one is running zero, and the last one is running rattle. And how much the data size for that Pokemon graph? How much? The data size for the actual data size for the Pokemon graph. The data size for the whole thing. That's a good question. I actually didn't look into it. Uh, if you look at the JSON, how do you, is it DF something? Uh, do you know how to check for that in there? I mean, Docker exec. Let, let's connect to the alpha, which is this one. Uh, okay, like being bash, bash, the bash IT. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the question is, once I'm in there, how do I look for? Oh. Data? OK, ls. du dash p. Oh, du dash sh. Oh my God, best. It is not as easy as it seems because there's actually a lot of uh, lag in between. I press the key and it appears on the screen. So I'm normally not this bad. Okay, so this is 190 megs. And if you look at the JSON, uh, so the JSON data, uh, there's probably more than that, but so data, API, 
du dash a let's say uh, actually dot uh, in JSON is 383 megs so it's actually smaller than the JSON any other question yes down there uh, for questions about the things that I have not talked about we have the Q&A at the end uh, let's keep the question about the things that I've mentioned yes uh, so uh if the data size grows to be a, like bigger, like around 50 million nodes or so, uh, how would the performance uh, still go on uh, depend? As its key value stored, uh, that one phase lookups would be fine, but as you go deeper, uh, there would be a lo lot of nodes you'll be looking up and then doing further hops. So how does your performance stays up? So uh, the thing is that you will not be doing further hops. Okay. That is the important thing, right? Like, uh, because of the design, the way it's done, uh, you're not going to be doing hops going out of the servers to get more, more data. You're going to do the minimum, which is a constant, a constant number of hops. It doesn't change depending on the data size. No, but uh, if I have, let's say, uh, friends of a director, let, let's say movies of a director, and then some more actors on it, yeah. then there, there are then you have a key value lookup, key, key value store, right? So you have yes. UX01, it would hops to X number of uh, uh, directors and then yeah. movies, and then it would X to Y number of uh, actors. There's certainly a hop that's there. How, how do you- There will be a hop if you're actually storing the data in a different group, like if the predicates are stored somewhere else, there will be a hop, but there will be the same number of hops no matter the size of the data. So. In that case, your uh, data local, like your uh, all the set of that group stays in the same uh, store? Not necessarily, but let's say if you have, you're getting like director and then the name, right? So you, you have two different predicates and they were in different machines. You would actually have to talk to different machines, obviously. But if you have one director and one name or you have one million and one million, that's still the same thing. It's still one query. If you would just send in more UIDs asking for more data. So uh, if it's not for predicates, if it's for uh, nodes which are there, uh, which are properties actually. Maybe I can take that. Yeah, sure, go for it. Um, I, think, I think the underlying question is, if the data size increases, um, would the query slow down? Yeah. Right. Now, data size could increase in the sense that the database has more data or your query is asking for more data. Right. If the query asks for the same amount of data, even though the database, database is now one terabyte, it should not take any more because you're still touching the same number of uh, keys underlying, right? So it, like, as in, like if a service grows and the number of relation increases and your query size actually would return more data, in that case, if your queries are returning more and more data, they would surely like slightly be, um, slightly be slower, right? Because you're just like touching more keys, but uh, key lookups in Badger are pretty efficient. And also the way we do expansions, we do it based on predicates. So the number of network calls that you need to do would remain the same. Um, the payload size would increase, right? And also because everything is integers, it's extremely efficient. Um, so uh, like the, the way it scales is really nicely. Because we have tried using graph databases and the thing is below second degree lookups, but it becomes really slow and the performance degrades to be used in an online application. Yeah, so um, more, I think, did you use Janus or something? No, we use Neptune. Neptune sucks. Um, so the, the way with Neptune, Janus, and almost all the other like graph layers, these are no databases, graph layers, what happens is to do a traversal, you need to first retrieve all the data to the layer, and then the layer does more queries. So the number of network calls that you have to make keeps on increasing proportionally to the size of the result set, right? In Dgraph, the biggest thing that we have done is we have kept the number of network calls constant to the number of predicates in the query itself, not the number of result, intermediate or final results. So you sort of pre-process the query and then that's like There is no query optimization, there's no query planning yet. We will probably add it later, but the, but the way we do it is that we, we would do like, let's say one level of expansion, we get the, the UIDs, and if you need to do another level expansion, convert it into a UID list and make one network call to the server which contains the predicate. And internally, it will do a bunch of lookups, et cetera, get a UID matrix back, 
So a lot of what DGraph does is going from UID list to UID matrix, right? And finally, you have, let's say you need to find the names. You have a list of UIDs, send it to the name, uh, the server which has a name, single network call again, bigger payload, and then it would do like name lookups internally, return the results, and now you have name. So this is actually pretty crucial. This is exactly what we're doing back at Google as well, is to decrease the number of network calls. You want to decrease the number of machines that you touch to execute a single query. That's the only way to achieve um, really good latency. Yeah, that answers. Thank you. Cool. All right. So can we go on here? A few online questions. Someone has a follow-up on no. uh, previous topic. Isn't it difficult to search based on separators? Based on separators? Yes. No. Why would it be difficult? No, I mean, if you have a, something that allows you to find those separators, so if you have like trigram or something like that, or the separator is separate, it's its own term, you could find it. There's no special thing for separators. All right. What is a consistency model of alphas? Consistency model of alphas. Yes. Uh, consistency model meaning, I mean, oh, it's, it's strong consistency. So basically, uh, as soon as you write something, uh, it's not alphas, but in general, the database, right? Like as soon as you write something, the next read, will return the data that you wrote, right? So it's strong consistency. It's not eventual consistency. Yeah. Cool. As you have mentioned yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, the, the exact term for that is called uh, linearizable reads, which means any read would be immediately available um, once the write is done. OK, thank you. And is there any way to query other than GraphQL plus minus like an SDK? Uh, so there's an SDK that uses a GraphQL plus minus. <laughs> so like uh, you have Go, we have four official clients. So Go, Python, Java, and JavaScript. There's also three more than official. There is like, ha no Haskell, Elixir, uh, Rust, and something else. C Sharp, C Sharp. Uh, but they also use GraphQL plus minus in internally. And in order to uh, not use that, we have GraphQL coming up soon. But those are for now the ones that you support, that we support. Great. So does GraphQL plus minus support contextual queries like Graph? Contextual queries. I have no idea what a contextual query is. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yes. <laughs> One more. Let's say I create nodes and predicates like below. Two is less than three. Three is less than four and go on. Can I write a query to return all nodes is less than five? Basically, do predicates follow transitivity property? Uh, so there's two ways of doing this. Uh, if you're actually storing the value of, you know, two, three, four, fives, et cetera, and you create an index, you could actually query all of the nodes that have a value of smaller than five. You can do that. The other way to do it, if you're actually storing as less than, and that is the relationship you're storing, you could also do that with recurse. You would find five and then use recurse to find all of the, all of the things that point at that as being less than and recursively. All yeah. right, thank you. Thank you. That's all. Cool, thank you. <laughs> uh, Okay, thank you all. Uh, thanks, Sanjay, for the first talk. Thank, Francisc. Uh, hope you all um, enjoyed all the talks. Thanks for all the questions that you asked. I'm sure there are a lot more questions that you guys have. Uh, I would request you all to kindly uh, keep a note of it, but we're going to have a, a separate round of uh, Q&A later on, um, and we have some dedicated time for it. Uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, break, uh, take a short break, um, and uh, we have news. Yeah, we have news that uh, uh, food is on the way. It's been dispatched, but it's likely that it's going to arrive in about 10, 15 minutes. So um, please feel free to take a break, and then we'll continue that break for uh, snacks. And uh, we'll join back for a talk by Manish, uh, and that'll be followed by uh, further Q&A. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Nishant. I have the huge privilege of leading people team here at Hotstar. Um, and I want to especially thank um, Manish, Francis, and Sanjay, the speakers of today, 
the organizers, Praveen and Ankur. Uh, thanks, thanks for giving us this opportunity to organize this here. We keep on organizing these events um, um, very often. Uh, in fact, there's a Kafka day that's happening tomorrow uh, between 10 and five. So most of you are welcome, all of you are welcome actually. And uh, do let your friends know, they can come over here. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little about, um, there's something really magical that's happening here at Hotstar. Um, and really the magic is not just the scale of IPL or the 25.3 million concurrent viewers, even though that's really, really awesome. It's not even the Game of Thrones or world-class acts like uh, Chernobyl, which are on our platform, which is also very, very awesome. But it's really about this bunch of talent that we've been able to gather and giving them the environment, toughest problems to solve and the environment where they can be inspired to do the best, which is really the thing that is, that is driving hot stuff. Um, we do have our colleagues. Um, there's Namit and Navgeet. Namit, can you raise your hand? Namit and Navgeet is not here, but they both are there from the data platform team. There is Sanjay. Sanjay from the personalization team. And we have Kuldeep and Shubhajit. All right. From uh, the social team, we have Aju, Dipayan, and Vanita from our talent acquisition team. They will be around uh, after the ask me anything, the question answer round is over. They'll be hanging out there. Very happy to have a chat with you guys. There's enough food to kind of keep on going till, till cows come home. So feel free to chat about them, about awesome stuff that's happening in Hotstar. If you would like to kind of join this awesome team of professionals. We are growing in all locations. Bangalore, which is our largest engineering base, Bombay, Gurgaon, and Beijing, which has some outstanding bunch of people that we've been able to put out there. So without further ado, I'm just gonna ask Dinesh to introduce the next speaker and uh, take this forward. Thanks everyone. Uh, hi, uh, so usually we don't have introductions to a speaker and Francis didn't even need uh, introduction. Uh, so Manish was in Golang Meetup, uh, I think 17, talking about internals of Badger. So I don't know how was the start after that, like they built so many things. And uh, like you can see DGraph and Badger, like almost 740 folks, some, something, right? 740 folks and so much contributors. So you guys should check out. So uh, I really th thank Manish for just shooting out a mail because they were traveling here for uh, the company and then Francis can, they uh, came out to give a talk. And because of him, like Francis is here, we can say for sure. So, <laughs> so thanks again, Manish for coming. And then we would like you to see you again. So you mm -hmm. can, Take those states. Yeah, thanks for having us. And uh, yeah, we showed the mail, and Dinesh was like very generous. Um, he was he was able to like set it up so that the timing of this meetup coincides with when we are here, and we are only here for a week. So thanks, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, so Francis gave a talk about DGraph, um, and uh, you know every database needs some level of cache. Um, we were using a cache before um, and it didn't really work out for us for various reasons, which is why we ended up building this thing called Ristrato. So Ristrato is a high performance uh, concurrent memory bound Go cache. And it's um, this sort of like all originates from uh, another piece that we had written. Let me see, where is it? Uh, somewhere over here. Yeah, this is called uh, state of caching in Go. And it just talks about like all the different issues that we faced while trying to um, build a highly concurrent cache in Go. The, yeah, the, the problem was that we were using um, group caches, LRU cache, right? And this is written by Brad. Fitzpatrick, who who wrote uh, memcached, right, and part of the core team, and we were using that uh, within DGraph. But the problem was that as the number of go routines increased, and we were trying to like really hit it hard, um, things if there was a lot of contention, and um, our queries started to slow down, and we did not realize this for a long time. Um, but at some point, we did, and uh, I remember like doing this commit. We did this change where I just removed the cache and our query latency improved 10 times. It was incredible. 
right? So Badger was doing load better job than we thought it would be doing. So you could imagine this, but the cash was slowing us down, right? And we were like, this is not good. So let's look around. And we, uh, that's what the blog post is about. We looked around, we looked at uh, big cash, fast cash, uh, some sync, sync uh, based cash and so on and so forth. Um, and we had like five requirements. It should be concurrent. It should be memory bound, right? We, we should be able to evict entries once the cache's memory gets filled up. Um, it should scale well as the number of accesses, concurrent accesses increase. So the number of cores, the number of go routines. And it should also scale well if you access the same keys over and over again. So a typical zip VN distribution says that um, certain number of keys get accessed exponentially more times than others. So it's sort of like an inverse exponential graph. Um, and it should scale well for those. And finally, it should still have a high hit ratio because if you're missing a lot, your cache actually slows you down, right? Um, we looked around and, you know, as I said, the blog post talked about all those things. We couldn't find anything which works. Um, so we looked outside of Go language and we found this uh, cache called Caffeine, written by a guy called Ben Mains, who wrote multiple papers about the cache. The cache was actually used by Cassandra. It's being used by Neo4j. It's being used by HBase. It's really one of the best caches available in Java land, right? Which is always the case, right? Go lacks a lot of libraries. We always find better libraries in other languages. For example, DocsDB is in C++. We couldn't use it, so we ended up writing Badger. In this case, Caffeine was in Java. We couldn't use. Uh, yeah, of course, we can't use Java. So we ended up writing uh, Ristretto. What is Ristretto? How many people drink Ristretto? How many people drink coffee? Two people, actually more. <laughs> um, so Ristretto is a is a short short of espresso. It's like half the size of espresso. Um, but um, uh, it, it contains the sweeter part of the espresso. So you can just put some milk in it and it's good to go. I like it. Um, also, Ristretto is a highly performant, concurrent, memory bound Go cache. It, it, it matches all the five things we're looking for, which is it gives a high hit ratio, gives a high read write throughput, it scales really well as the number of cores increase, and it is contention proof, which is a big claim, right? but it, it literally is, is saving against contentious um, settings. So even if you access it a lot with multiple go routines running at the same time, it would not slow you down. So just to give you a sense for how the cache looks, this is how you would uh, um, you know, create it. So it is started out doing cache num counters, max cost, and buffer items. And it might make no sense, like what are these settings? Um, max cost is basically telling what is the maximum cost the cache could have before it needs to evict things out of the cache to make space, right? And uh, the good thing about Ristrato is that it does not assume what the cost is per key. For example, in a lot of LRU caches, uh, each key costs one which is generally not how things are done. Like some values could be really big. And if you put in them in the cache, the cache's memory usage is really high. So, but it was, we actually have a cost associated with each key, right? And so you can specify the words of max cost that the whole cache should have, right? Um, so you create this thing, num counters um, is a way to keep track of the frequency at which we have seen the keys. So how many keys frequency can we track? That is set by num counters. Um, and some of the techniques that we're using, um, it makes it extremely efficient for us to keep track of the frequency of keys that we have seen. And by seen, I mean, if, we, if some key did a get or if some key had a set, that means we have seen. And if they have five gets, the counter should be five, right, roughly. Um, <clears throat> Then we have cache.set, which is the key, the value, and the cost. The cost in this case is one, right? Um, we sleep a bit now. This is this this gets this is something we'll discuss like as we go through the slides. Then you do a cache.get and hopefully you get the value. You found it. 
clear foreign panic, and then you can also delete a key from a cache. So it's a cache, right? I mean, ultimately it's very simple. Set, get, and delete. That's it. Any questions so far? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so I'll discuss like the mechanisms that we had to use to build this cache. I won't go too much into why we build the cache. We already have a blog post about that. Um, I'll discuss like what makes this cache so interesting. Right. So the first thing that we did was we found an interesting way to use runtime functions. Um, Core team has this thing they call memhash, which uses assembly instructions to get a hash of a string or a um, byte array or or something. So what we did was we don't we didn't want to pay the cost of having to keep the key. The key could be really long, right? Could be 64 bytes, 128 bytes, 362 bytes. Who knows, right? I mean, um, so we didn't want to like pay the cost. So we just took a hash of the key and we made that the basis for storage. Right. Now, somebody could argue, hmm, there would be uh, collisions. There could be collisions. That's true. Right now, the cache doesn't handle that. It's a to-do for us to detect those and uh, deal with that. Right. But um, instead of using any existing hash functions, there is farm.fingerprint64, which we use in dgraph. There are others. Um, we uh, hooked into Go's memcache, uh, memhash. And uh, that gives us a hash in like five nanoseconds or something. It's really fast, yeah. <clears throat> um, the cache itself, the storage part of the cache, we tried various things. We, we used a uh, logged sync mutex and just the whole cache, which is hash map, go hash map, right? Um, there was one that we tried. We used sync.map. There's a second one that we tried, and for a long time we felt that that must be the most efficient. Um, but uh, once everything was done, we started looking and realized that that's not the most. In fact, single map is actually pretty slow. Um, so we did a sharded map where we had 256 shards. Each shard has a uh, lock, and then it has a normal go map, right? And the way we decide the shard. Now, if we were in some other uh, let's say programming language, we would know which thread is actually dealing with the access. So we can do thread local, right? In Go, that doesn't exist because Go team would not expose that to you. So what we did was we had the hash, uh, this hash, which was cheaper, right? So we took that hash and we determined the chart based upon this hash, right? We already have this information, we can reuse it. <laughs> So what do we do for concurrency? Mechanism number three, there's a paper called BP wrapper. Um, what it basically says is that for excesses which would hit critical paths, which require serialization, locking, et cetera, instead of hitting it every time, every invocation, you batch them up, batch up these operations, and then you acquire the lock once, you do those things and then you release a lock. So you decrease the number of times the lock is acquired and released. In fact, the way they suggest doing it is to fill up a ring buffer. Once it's filled up, do the critical section together for all of those accesses or keys or whatever, like drain it into the critical section, then remove. And it makes every, almost they say, every algorithm really fast. So we use that pretty heavily. We use it for both our gets and our sets. The question then became, how do we build these ring buffers? What's the best way to build them? So we tried many things, right? Um, the gets based upon the paper for caffeine. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, so what I understood, you write into the case in a batch mode. So it will not uh, hamper the availability of uh, read operation, which are there in the ring buffer. Um, yeah, so um, I was gonna get to it, but I can get to it right now. Um, what will happen is if you do some get, initially you'll go to a ring buffer, which means it's not applied to the cache itself, uh, which means the frequency tracking that we're doing for that key would not be updated yet. 
right? Uh, but generally, that's okay. We haven't seen that uh, affecting our hit ratios too much, right? However, in sets, um, if you notice, we were, yep, you were doing a time to sleep here, right? Uh, it's because we, there is a mechanism going on there, which is, which is the moment the set returns, the set might not be done yet. It's actually gets done in the background. Um, so the sets would be slightly delayed. So, um, so all gets are put into a lossy buffer, right? So the question was for us was uh, how do we build this lossy buffer again, like in Java or other language C++, you might know thread local. So you just put that in thread local uh, buffer that you have. You don't have to acquire any locs. Things are really fast, but in Go, you don't have that. So what do you do? Other mechanism was to explore using channels. We tried using channels. Channels was uh, no less fast. Right, um, and then there was a, a bug that we found. Somebody was like complaining to go to him, saying, "Hey, why don't you expose the the threads?" Um, and uh, when they were actually using it themselves in sync dot pool, um, so that he was like, "Hmm, sync dot pool actually uses threads internally. Maybe we can use sync dot pool." Right. So what we did was we did a simple thing. Uh, we create these stripes. Right. We put the stripe using, we get it from pool.get. So it gives us the stripe. We push the key into the stripe and we put the stripe back into the pool. We don't have to acquire any more locks because once you get it, you, only you have access to it. No locking required and then you put it back. Now think about sync.pool if you understand is that um, if there is too many ring stripes or objects in sync.pool, when GC runs, it's going to remove some of them, right? So that's the first level of lossy, right? Because GC might be able to remove some entries from single pool itself. Um, and the second level of lossy, which I think on the next slide. Um, but basically, single pool performed way better because it internally had access to thread local. Yeah, it's pretty unique way of single pool. I did not think about it. One of the guys working on the team, he figured it out. Um, so, so gets are processed with a delay, right? Only when the stripe reaches its capacity, right? Um, and um, um, so what happens is, you know, we, we go the stripe from the sync dot pool right here, right? And after that, there is a thing which says, oh, is the stripe capacity reach? In which case, flush it out. And uh, the way it flushes it out is that it pushes it into a channel then, items ch, right? Push it into channel now. If there's too many pending writes, uh, I think the items channel has capacity of three, so it will just go to default and just get dropped. So we are okay dropping a bunch of gets to make sure that the cache internally doesn't get overwhelmed, hence causing slowness to your operations. Right. Um, so mm, the cache capacity reached. The keys are pushed into admission policy. If there's too many pending, push will be dropped. That's lossy behavior too, right? We got all the losses. And then internally, what happens is with the push for each key, we increment. You don't need to worry about what increment does right now. We'll get to that later. Yeah. So the big picture is not clear. Is this a client side cache? Is this right through, right back? Is it only per process? Um, it is. Uh, Generally per process, yeah. But you could you could have as many instances of this cache running around, yeah. Right through, right. Um, I'm not sure what right through, right back means. It, uh, every every put does it get get uh, percolated to the back end? Some some you know you have. Oh, uh, it's not persistent cache. It's just a just a cache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So mechanism number five, we also had to make sure that the sets don't overwhelm the system, which means that sets are put into another lossy buffer, right? Uh, and for sets, we, for gets, we, what we do is we have a ring buffer, we add the element to the ring buffer, then we fill it up. Once it gets filled up, then we apply it, right? But sets, we didn't want to wait that long. We didn't want to fill up like 128 sets and then apply them because like user would complain, hey, what's happening? 
even if there's no contention, it takes forever. That's not right. So what we had to do was we, we had to use channels in this case. Um, so what we do is once the site comes, we create an item out of it, which has the key, the value, and the host, as we had seen before, puts it into the buffer. If the buffer is already full, just drops it. Right. So it would drop sets. But the, the good thing is that um, we have this channel. This channel is constant, consistently being processed by another go routine, which is applying these sets. Yeah. Aren't you keeping the CPU busy in this cycle? It's not a cycle. It's just a, it's not a for loop. Okay. It's just a one select. So it will return uh, drop sets and false. So, so if you are dropping every time, so next time request comes and then it's get to execute it to default, right? Only if set buff is full, okay. right? If set buff is not full, it will push to set buff. Yeah. Thanks. And actually, you do want it to drop if it's already pretty full because, again, like you don't want your gets and sets to slow down your application, which is one of the things that I mentioned. It's contention proof. It really meant that when the cache is like operating at capacity, we just start dropping stuff, right? And the cache takes care of that. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, so both gets and sets would drop items if too many are pending, right? This performs really well under contention. We tried it with so many go routines and like so many loops and stuff. Um, the hit ratio obviously gets slightly affected, right? If we're dropping a lot of gets and sets, hit ratio is affected, but we realized that it was still much better than all the other alternatives, um, which we tried, which is big cache and uh, fast cache and so on and so forth. Um, so it degrades, but it degrades like slightly. Um, it does mean that sets can be lost or rejected. Um, so that's something your application would need to be aware of, right? Uh, it's not consistent in that way. So just because you did a set doesn't mean it would be there. You might have to do, if you do a get, you might not find it. But the idea is that then you can do another set later if you really need to. A uh, lot of cases, you do a set and the key is never accessed. Then again, like it basically like set is not is not a given, right? Now it does cause a problem where you already the cache already had that key, right? And let's say set was dropped, then you now have a old value for a key which already exists in the cache, and for that we'll have a separate mechanism. So if the key already exists, we just update it. Yeah, that way you don't get a stale value for a key which already exists. Hi, uh, so I have a question uh, regarding the thinking that was going on while designing. Um, and what sort of factors affected uh, your design choices? So with regard to lossy behavior, for example, so uh, at one place, lossy behavior point number two, uh, the channel only accepts uh, three items, and if, if if it's more than that, then you just drop it, right? And uh, uh, the lossy behavior can affect your uh, cache hit ratio, like you mentioned before. So, uh, all these design design decisions was it a uh, was it an iterative process? Uh, uh, what what was yeah. the thinking behind these? We um, so by the way, this this items ch is not three items; it's like three slices of keys. And so the key is the size of the ring buffer, which which is I think set to um, initially we set it to sixty four or something. Let me see. Uh, buffer items, so it's like you can configure these things. Right? Um, so it's sixty four. Um, but the way we decided to build this thing, we looked at the papers, right? So we looked at uh, caffeine. The um, author Ben Mains had written a paper about caffeine itself also written blog posts about it. We looked at um, the BB wrapper paper. So we had like a list of like four or five papers that we followed to be able to build this thing. And Caffeine itself um, had the whole concept of low C ring buffers and so on and so forth. So the biggest thing for us is to, was to figure out how best we can implement that in Go, right? Because in, in Java, they had the benefits of thread local storage. They even had a um, sort of a concurrent hash map, which doesn't require any logs at all. 
right? So they could just have one map for everything. But in Go, we don't have that. So we had to use a sharded thingy. Or we tried sync map and so on and so forth. So the biggest thing was what parts we take uh, from those papers and from the implementation and how do we get it in Go to perform really well. Um, other things in Java that they had was they had a LRU-based cache. And we decided that uh, LRU was a bit of an overkill. In fact, it would be slower. And we built it based upon LFU. So LRU is least recently recently used, right? And LFU is least frequently used. And so tiny LFU, which I was mentioning about, uh, which keeps track of keys to counters, which is the frequency of access, we use that information to figure out what to evict and admit. But we'll get to that. Uh, in the set, we are adding it to the buffers, right? Um, once we get a get, like, uh, do we need to check in the buffers as well? If you do a get um, in Ristrato, um, we will check in the cache if it's there or not first, right? And uh, then we'll capture it through the ring buffer mechanism. Um, so it might not be there in the cache yet. Is that the question? Yeah, I mean, when we do a set, it goes to the buffers first, mm -hmm. not into the cache yet. No. On, 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 when you're doing the get on it, mm -hmm. um, maybe it might be a miss. It, it might be a Even miss. after doing a set, it might be a miss. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one mechanism you mentioned about uh, stale values will definitely be updated. So just before setting, you if in you are you doing get and in case you are doing get, if it fails, uh, like will it affect the performance? Um, so the mechanism that uh, that we are adding is a to do it should be one line change uh, would basically do a update if present basically right so when you call the set it will quickly check the cache the map the right chart of it and if the key already exists there it will update it and just return in which case it does not need to put it in the set buffer set buffer right because it's already done um, so that way we can make sure that uh, if the key already exists, we can deal with it. But we don't do a separate get per se, we, you know, yeah. Okay, um, the, one of the thing, annoying things that I f found about other caches was like they were all assuming that the key value costs one, right? It just makes no sense. Um, including almost all the LRU, uh, implementations I've seen, they would just do it based upon number of elements, which is a lot simpler implementation because for every key you add, you remove one key, so the costs are fixed, right? But that's just not how things work in practice. You might add a value which is a thought, like a kilobyte and other values which are all like 32 bytes. So if you add a kilobyte, you might have to remove like hundreds of 32 byte key values to make the same, to utilize the same space. Right, um, and so we want to make sure that this is built in a way where we understand all that, right? And we do the right mechanisms for it. So each key value um, has a distinct cost, and the cost is set using the set, right? So key well and the cost, you can specify it. Um, internally, it maintains a key to cost map, which is uh, separate. Now this is not the frequency map, which is different, right? Because the frequency map's job is to capture all the keys in the ecosystem or as, as many as you can. This is just the keys which are in the cache, right? Uh, which, are, which have the value and so on and so forth. So it maintains a key to cost and the total capacity of the cache is based on this cost. So you can, when you said max capacity, um, the cost is counted against that max capacity. Um, it can be, I think for example in Badger, we could set it to the bytes, byte length for key and value, but actually the key is even 64, so the length of the value. Um, or if you so desire, you can still set it to one for just keeping the number of elements. So now this is the tricky part about Restrato, the policy, right? This is where a lot of research uh, that we used uh, was done. <laughs> Um, typical caches don't have an admission policy. If you do LRU, everything that gets uh, set would be admitted, 
right? It would get put, and then later they will figure out the the oldest one and remove that, and that's that, right? There's no admission policy. But if you really want to improve the hit ratios, you must be smarter than that. You have to figure out, does is it worth to add this key to the cache or not, right? Because a lot of times what happens is you see the key only once, and you never see them again. But it adds like computational resources, it costs, and it, it will probably evict something which has a higher chance of getting accessed again. And so it will affect your hit ratios. So there is two things that we do here to um, deal with that. The first one is to use a Bloom filter. So we have the, you know, the hash, UN64, so we don't have to calculate it again. Uh, we use that and we try to see if um, this key has been seen before or not. If it's the first time we are seeing it, that means the key was not present in the Bloom filter, we add it, but we don't do anything more. We stop right there. Right? Um, we don't add it to the next mechanism. Um, and if it was if it was present, then we go to the next the next level. So think of it as like layered approach, right? The first is the doorkeeper just says, hey, have I seen you before or not? If I have, pass through. If I have not, stop right there. I have registered you. So if you come back again, I will let you pass through, but not this time. People know Bloom filters, right? Yeah, 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 one guy. Uh, pretty sure more people know. But if somebody doesn't know, Bloom filter is basically, a, think of it as like a simple test, which will tell you if something is definitely absent, but wouldn't be sure if it's present or not. Does it make sense? Yeah. Tell you if it's definitely absent. All right. Mechanism number eight, um, tiny LFU. And that's where a lot of the, the research by Ben Mains was done. Um, so tiny LFU, in, uh, let's say, if you had infinite memory, right? For every key access, you will be able to store the frequency of access, right? Infinite memory. Um, and if you had that information, you would then be able to build a very highly effective cache. Because you know, for every key which comes, you see hmm, this was only accessed five times, but all the keys that I have were accessed at least 10 times, right? So I can reject this one. I don't need to add it to my cache if you are at capacity. If you're not at capacity, you just add it, right? Yeah. But it all becomes more interesting when you're at capacity. Um, now, there is a cost to keeping a counter, right? So let's say if you use a in 32 counter or int, uh, I think ints are typically in 32s, right? In uh, 64, do you know? In Go, if you have an int, is it in 32 or in 64? <laughs> Depends on the argument. But I think everybody has AMD, right, 64? So every 64 then 64, I guess, right? I guess, yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, even if you were to use, let's say int, then every key would use 64 uh, bits, eight bytes, right? So if you need to then have uh, a thousand of them using uh, eight kilobytes, a million of them uses eight megabytes, a billion of them uses eight gigabytes, which is quite a lot, right? Um, so Tani LFU, what it does is that it only uses four bits for each uh, key, which means if you have a billion keys, it would use 512 megabytes as opposed to eight gigabytes, which is pretty efficient, right? Um, and it does that in a sort of like a interestingly complex way by using three different um, sort of, uh, uh, it will kind of create a key and have three different like hashes come out of it and it'll update each and every one of them to, to figure out what's the, what's the counter and uh, it will pick the minimum of them to find the estimate of that key, the frequency of uh, that key. Uh, but I won't go into that. There's a talk on its own. Um, but basically we have a smart way uh, which can be extremely cheap about keeping track of the frequency of the keys access, right? That's tiny LFU. And on top of that, you don't want that a key which was accessed, let's say two days ago, it's still consuming space, right? 
Um, so you want to have some level of recency. And how do you do that? What you do is that um, we would reset this uh, at tiny LFU. We buy slashing all the counters uh, by half for every N excesses. Right? So after every N keys we have seen, we will just say whatever the counter value is for everybody divided by half. Right? That means we have some recency. Um, and, and if you think about some key which was seen two days ago and never seen again, it would go to zero pretty, pretty quickly. Right? Um, so then there is recency like that. Right? <clears throat> and then this increment, right? How does this panel if you increment key? So as I said, like the first thing to do is use the bloom filter. So if it checks add, if not has, if it does not have it, add it to the bloom filter, right? And we was um, uh, not added, then uh, um, which means it was already there. Then we increment the um, the freq is a tiny LFU. Then we increment in tally LFU. So basically, like the bloom filter is right here, tally LFU is right here. Uh, try to first add to bloom filter. If you were able to add to it, then skip. If you were if it was already there, pass through to the tiny LFU and increment to tiny LFU. Right. Even though it seems a bit weird, right? We should change the code to make it a bit more clear. Um, but um, but that's what happens, right? First bloom filter, then Daniel FU. And then if the number of times like increments that we have seen, you know, are greater than reset at, then we reset, which is divided by half. Um, all the counters. So that's tiny LFU. Um, and uh, I think one thing here is the, our admission and eviction is kind of the same mechanism, right? So what we're doing is for all the incoming keys, the gets or sets, we are updating the estimate. The estimate is, um, if you look here, yeah. So this, this mechanism gives us increment, which is what we just saw, and gives an estimate, which is the estimate of the frequency, right? And the reset, which is divided by half, right? Um, so just one interesting thing, right? The estimate, uh, if it's something is in bloom filter, but not in tiny LFU, the estimate would be one, right? Because bloom filter would also count. Uh, but we, we always increment irrespective of whether we add something to the cache or not. We increment every time we see some, something. We can reject them later, but we'll still increment them. All right. So, um, so all the incoming keys update the estimate. And uh, what we now want to do in a perfect world is that for every incoming key, we want to evict the key with the minimum estimate, which is the minimum frequency um, key. But it is hard, right? We have to keep like a min heap or something. Um, and it, it's expensive. And the more keys you have, the slower things would get. Because even if you take a min heap, it's still low algorithmic, right? So what we do instead is go maps uh, iterate the keys randomly, uh, sort of like a feature of Go, right? Um, it's uh, at least we use it as a feature. Uh, so what we do is we we pick up like five keys from the the cost map, the the key to cost. I don't actually remember that um, because we actually have the the storage, which is the key to value in sharded map, right? Uh, but then we have the actual cost, the key to cost, just in normal map, because that didn't need to be accessed so frequently. So anyway, so then we need to generate the list of sample keys, we just iterate, we get five keys, they become our samples. And then what we do is that we find the minimum estimate for those five keys by getting their estimates. Uh, so if you remember, estimate is a frequency of access, right? So for those five, we will check, hey, what's the what's your estimate? What's your estimate? And we get five estimates. We pick the minimum of them, and then we compare the estimate of the minimum uh, key, which would be the evicted key, in in case, right? Um, is its estimate less than the estimate of the incoming key? 
right? So the incoming key, uh, the frequency of access the incoming key has seen is that higher than what we are going to evict, right? It should be higher. If it's lower, you should not uh, admit it. There's no point adding something whose frequency of access is so low. Right. So, so what we'll do is um, the evicted keys estimate is lower the incoming key. Then we'll add the incoming key. Otherwise, we we'll reject the incoming key. So that's admission, right? And also eviction. But here's the actual algorithm, right? So the incoming key we do the estimate. Can you guys see this in the back and stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we get the hits, we call it hits, of the, uh, the estimate of the incoming key, right? That's ink estimate. And this room left is just like, how much room does the cache have, which is based upon the max capacity, right? Um, if it is, only if it is less than zero, we'll do this. If we have more room, then we don't need to do any of this. We just add and continue, right? I mean, if your cache is empty, might as well fill it, right? Um, so anyway, so if the, there's no room left, then we'll continue. We'll get the sample. We find the, the minimum key, the minimum hits for that key, which is the estimates, right? And if the incoming uh, estimate is lower than the minimum estimate, we will reject it. And if it is not, then we will delete the minimum key and we will remove it from the sample and we'll uh, fill up uh, the sample again until the capacity that we have is again below the um, max, right? And we'll continue to this. So basically what could happen is, um, let's say some big value comes a kilobyte and we have uh, 256 byte values inside. So we'll go through this three, four times, right? So we'll go first time, let's say we found something which was uh, 256 bytes, we evict them. The cost now, you know, the gap decreases to 726 bytes. We go again, we find something, we evict them. Now their gap is 512 bytes. We go again, and this time, actually the, the min hits is actually greater uh, than the incoming, in which case we will then go ahead and reject it anyways. So we will have two evictions, but we will still not add the incoming because we couldn't find uh, something with a estimate lower than what we were admitting. Hey, uh, so you're actually evicting some of the things without even adding more things to the cache? Yeah, um, it's just simplicity of the code. We decided it was better to just do it because we are also looking at the room left and stuff and all of that mechanism works when you delete something. So we didn't want to like complicate that. So yes, we might end up evicting a bunch of stuff and then still not add the new thing, yeah. But the cache gets used, so. Just, uh... Intuition wise. Oh, there's a lot of benchmarks here. Yeah. Yeah. When you want to build a really fast, concurrent, high performance, and if you don't run a benchmark, you know, that's just bad, right? The room left is just the. You are checking for that, right? That mm -hmm. condition. So, yeah. you, you, when you say if inc inc increment it is less than minimum it's right? So, I mean, what made you to, I mean, uh, uh, have eviction at there as well, I mean. So, at particular that uh, logic, right? I mean, what kind of benchmark or is it backed by some benchmark or? I mean, this is just logic, right? This is like just doing what uh, what it should be doing, which is that it should be finding the, the key with the minimum estimate and evicting that to make space for the incoming key. What? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's general benchmarks about performance of the cache. And uh, the other question was like, should we even delete a key without making sure that the new one can come in, right? But that's just about core simplicity. Um, and we didn't think it should affect things too much anyways. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, when does the eviction policy come into place? 
uh, once we reach capacity, right? So, um, you know, like the gets are coming, sets are coming, gets going to ring buffer, sets going to this thing. And when the set is running in a loop in a go routine, right? Uh, when we are setting, that's when we check uh, whether it should be emitted. And if it is being admitted, something should be evicted or not, right? So for every admittance, there might be an eviction or might be multiple evictions depending upon the cost. Yeah, so my question now is, uh, when the cache gets filled for here, uh, does the eviction policy keep getting called now for each set that is being set because mm -hmm. it's full? Yeah. Is there likely. no mechanism where you kind of clean up a little bit because you don't want to go through this loop each time? This is happening in the background, right? It's yeah. not happening in critical path. Critical path is like just pushing the set into a channel yeah. and then there's a go routine which is running this critical path in like background. So you don't really care how fast this works. If it is slow, right, then the channel would get filled up and then all the other sets would get thrown away. So your application is not slowed down. Right. So, so about recency. So, how frequently it goes? Is it a kind of configurable, or uh, I mean, uh, how frequently it goes where? I mean, for recency. Mm -hmm. So you perform some recency where you do half of the yeah. uh, frequency, right? I mean, uh, it's all configurable. Yeah, you can configure like how how often do you want to uh, do the halving? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, regarding the range using for randomness, I think usually when we run any small programs or test programs, um, if I have the keys added in one, two, three, four, five, if I run it, I may get in random order. But if I run one more time, the same random order comes. I mean, it's not really random for every run. I think probably here you may be finding it because the map is very huge and you may be changing it regularly. There's some sets going in different routines. I'm just assuming that. It is a oh, small I, program which I had. Mm -hmm. It comes in random one time, but it just repeats. Yeah. Uh, I did not know that. Um, seems strange, right? I mean, why would it maintain a consistent uh, order? Okay, maybe. Yeah. I, I tried playground, I mean, go playground. Maybe, yeah, I may be wrong also. I mean, Go team wouldn't want that anyways because the whole point of adding randomness was to make sure that people don't depend upon the ordering. The moment you start giving back the same ordering, people start depending upon it. So it would like violate their own guidelines. So I, I, I mean, I don't know, but I don't think that should be the case. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess it's worth, but the thing is like, if we were evicting something, we must be adding something as well, right? I mean, so then it should probably work out, yeah. So, uh, small question. So, you might have found multiple evictions, but then there's a lot of room left and then you just add everything. So, you had a mechanism to keep track of evicted things, but then admitted whatever came. So, oh, actually, like, um, we are only evicting as much as we need, right? So. <laughs> Uh, the cost is the cost of the incoming, mm -hmm. so we keep we track. So I mean, if the we would only evict as much as needed to admit this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so if this thing does get admitted, then ultimately the cost would be very close to max. Okay. So in the case it gets admitted, it's fine. Yeah. But in the case it ultimately gets rejected, yeah. there will be a ton of room left, uh, and okay. then whatever comes in next will just kind of should be yeah. able to depending upon their cost. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, so the mechanisms are all explained. Uh, looks like you guys are all like you guys understand this riddle. Uh, let's do the throughput benchmarks, right? So we ran using cache bench written by uh, Aman. Aman is around. Um, and I think Aman had given a talk about the previous blog post that we had written about state of caching in Go. So, so he has really nice benchmarks that we used. We ran them on a i7 machine, 3.7 gigahertz, 
three scores, 16 gigabyte RAM. Um, then the second thing was we had to run hit ratio benchmarks. And hit ratio benchmarks we, we ran using Damian Girsky's uh, um, uh, benchmarking uh, repository. Right, so we use some from our cache test, which is inside the Stratos itself, and some from uh, Damian's uh, repository. Um, and in the hit ratios, we actually used like different kinds of um, uh, workloads, and so we look at that. And to figure out if the hit ratio is good or not, we had to build an optimum hit ratio uh, policy. Right, and an optimum hit ratio policy, uh, theoretically optimum, is uh, it basically predicts the future because what it does is that it would keep track of whatever you have accessed, and then it will try to figure out what is after you have accessed everything, reach the end, then it would start to use that information from the future to predict how best it can service requests. Um, so it's not something you can build and use but it is very good to figure out what is theoretically possible and how close you get to it that's what they use for linux uh, page uh, replacement algorithm to like figure out how well it's performing okay the results are here now can i get to it Let's see. there it is all right this is ristrados um Read me, right? So, uh, looking at the the hit ratios, right? The first one is for search, the disk read accesses initiated by a large commercial search engine in response to various web search requests. And we have Ristrato, Big Cache, Free Cache, Fast Cache, Goboro, Group Cache, and then the optimal is this gray line, right? So Ristrato comes pretty close to optimal, stays pretty close there. And then the next one is Goboro, but then the Big Cache and free cache and others sort of like kind of pale, right? So in this case, we go all the way up to like 70, 65%. Um, so 70 or 65, we get pretty close to optimal. That's for search. Um, then there's a database uh, hit ratios workload. So database server running at a commercial site, et cetera. And again, the optimal is over here. And this is somewhere over here. And the thing go borrow is kind of like close to this right? But I think Gobor is also really slow because um, otherwise we would have just used it. Uh, and the others are like not so great. Okay. Then there is some sort of a looping access. Uh, I think in this case, we could not use the uh, big cache and fast cache because they have a minimum requirement of how much memory they have to use. And some of these uh, required that the memory should be really small. Um, and so we could not run those benchmarks. Um, they would have just shown up as 100% because the memory that we had to have and what they use is like they use much, much harder. So we removed them. Similarly, for Corda Sale, this is Strato, Goboro, and Group Cache. Uh, we, it looks like we slightly paled here. What? All right. And then comes the throughput, right? This is the fun stuff. Um, if we look at state of caching in Go, um, let me see, right over here. Yeah, that's the one. So for read only, we have write only, and then we have mixed. Um, the maximum we could get to, this is big cache, free cache and group cache. I was like 45 million operations per second at like 32 cores, 32 addresses, uh, go routines, something, right, 45. And with Ristrato, um, for reads, we are getting to, we're quickly getting to like 55 to 60 and above 60 as we go higher, right? And the throughput is, is much higher than everything else. So I think big cache is here, fast cache is here, so and so forth. And uh, for the mixed one, we again, like we kind of like reach our ultimate um, sort of number pretty quickly. And then we sort of somewhere in that, in that range, right? And everything else. This is the number of go routines, by the way. I should have mentioned. This is the number of go routines. This is the throughput. The how many operations can you do per second? And so the higher, the better. And then we have the write, um, which is similar. 
right? So, so um, the shadow quickly goes above and then stays above everybody else in terms of um, right throughput. All right, and we are hiring in Bangalore. <laughs> That's it. Uh, by the way, I think uh, one thing I should mention, we haven't announced Ristrado yet, right? So please don't put it on Reddit or Hacker News yet. Uh, we are working upon a blog post to make sure that we cover various things and then we will announce it and that will be a good time to put it. So, so just keep it to yourself. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, actually, that's another thing. Uh, but still, uh, in order to, like, I mean, since we've mentioned, you might be having some questions. And also, it's interesting to ask some non tech questions also. So, we'll keep a tab on time and we have, like, we can close it at two o'clock. Uh, so, we have a bunch of questions here offline and you guys can also shoot. So, we'll take three questions here and share one uh, from the sheet. So, uh, by the way, just to set the context, he's ex-Googler, ex-Cora, uh, all the stuff you can ask. Uh, Francisk, yeah, shoot him anything. <laughs> so, uh, also just to like probably set the guidelines, uh, don't ask too much broad question, too broad, because it's hard to answer it in short answers and also come to conclusion, because that sort of fits for a discussion. Uh, yeah. Keep time in mind, that's it. No, hello, okay. Yeah. Um, I would say feel free to ask questions. I mean, you know, don't put so many restrictions. Um, oh, uh, do we have a little yeah, um, right. And by the way, guys, we also have a bunch of t-shirts that we brought, obviously. Um, so people who ask questions, get t-shirts, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I should, I think the reason why Francis was smelling it, because as I was bringing it to Bangalore, um, I had a bottle of scotch in that bag, which Air India have decided to, to shatter, and all of that went into this. So they are dry cleaned with a very expensive scotch. They, they don't smell anymore, if I can confirm, or at least not much. <laughs> yeah, I had a question. So um, what are some of the guidelines as a founder? You know, how, how do you balance time between coding, evangelizing, talking to investors, getting customers, hiring? It's, it's hard. Uh, I think um, uh, not sleeping helps, right? <laughs> But in general, what I try to do is I will keep, um, I think Wednesdays and Thursdays, try to keep it as free of meetings as possible so I can have some dedicated time to code um, and uh, and then put the meetings in the other ones. Yeah. But yeah, in general, it's just, it's just not recommended to try to do everything that I'm doing. Oh. Yeah, hey, uh, so so uh, when you are creating nodes, so some of the nodes will be created on server one, some of the nodes might be created on server two. So when you, you are aggregating nodes based on relation, so you have to pull data from different servers. So what kind of hashing mechanism uh, you maintain that this node is uh, created on this server? So the so uh, basically what we do is uh, we store the data. Oh, you mean uh, for every specific... Uh, the partition uh, algorithm? Yeah, so the way we shard data is actually based on the predicate. So once you send, uh, say, I'm going to store something about H, we're going to find the zeros, know where H belongs to, in what group. So then uh, when you talk to an alpha to say, store this information, they're going to store it, and they're actually going to do a transaction uh, and in this case, it would be only one, uh, the transaction would be in one group, but then we can do it across multiple ones. But, but there's no caching if that's what you were asking. No, I, think, I think the, the question was like, how do we store nodes and how do we partition nodes? 
there is no concept of uh, node storage in Degra because nodes are just UIDs, there's integers. So whoever accesses it, whichever predicate access it, it will be stored there, right? So if, if name is saying, if name belongs to a UID and age belongs to a UID, then there'll be two different shards and the name shard would point to that UID, age shard would have that UID. So there's no real nodes. We, we cannot aggregate across all the nodes because we just don't know, right? We, we will have to scan everybody to figure out the nodes. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, thanks. One question from here. Uh, why did you go for building the And uh, why that will last for you? They both worked out. I mean, <laughs> um, the Go, I think if I had not chosen Go, I would have chosen C++ because I didn't like Java, I didn't like Python. Um, and um, I think at that time, at least, I felt like the language library support for C++ outside of Google was not very good. Inside Google, we actually had amazing libraries, so you don't have to think about anything else. But even within Google now, Go is being used pretty heavily. Um, but yeah, Go worked out really nicely because the code is so readable and it is so much more maintainable that uh, you would spend a lot of effort trying to maintain C++ code. So Go worked out like that. Performance was also great. I mean, as Badger shows, another thing show, um, there might be some disagreements about how much Go team exposes to end users, but ultimately, like it, it all works out. Um, the second question was also I wanted to add, uh, Go doesn't have memory corruption. <laughs> C plus plus, it does. So. <laughs> Um, GraphQL, I think I liked GraphQL when it came out. This was back in 2015, and um, I showed it to my manager, who was who, be, who was the head of search, uh, and uh, he uh, he he was building MetaWeb. MetaWeb uh, was a building uh, sort of like knowledge graph. So when Google acquired MetaWeb, that's how they got knowledge graph, and they had their own query language called MetaWeb query language. So he felt that graph. QL was very close to MetaWeb query language. I did not like Cypher, did not like Kremlin uh, because they will return lists of things and GraphQL will allow you to return a subgraph. You can go from a subgraph to a list. You can't go from a list to a subgraph um, and GraphQL was just simpler, so on and so forth. And uh, from the point of view of like, why are we uh, adopting GraphQL now, right? Like on top of GraphQL plus minus, uh, GraphQL is a humongous community with a lot of uh, it's a very rich ecosystem with tooling and solutions. So being able to integrate with that makes a lot of sense. So uh, my question is about adoption of graph DBs inside uh, more traditional applications, say enterprise apps versus new age apps. So new age apps, you're building something now makes a lot of sense. But uh, from your perspective, how have you seen graph databases being adopted in traditional enterprises and uh, related thing is uh, like what skills do DBAs need to have right, in order to build that? Um, I think a lot of adoption for DGraph that we have seen has been around greenfield projects, like new projects that the companies have, even though the companies might themselves be traditional. Um, but typically what happens is they are using some graph database. It's not working out for them because of various reasons. And they have a new project and they start to look for the best graph database for that project. Um, and that's when they, they start using DGraph. So I think it's... Um, in fact, in fact, all the companies that we know about are using graphs, and in fact, they have built it. So Google, Facebook, um, uh, Amazon, Dropbox, Pinterest, uh, Airbnb, Twitter, everybody has had to build a graph system, right? The new age, yeah. yeah. Actually, Neo4j said in the last race that 20 out of 25 banks in the US, top 25 were using Neo4j, so they get used. Uh, two questions. Uh, if you were uh, writing the graph today, would you pick anything other than Go? And second, uh, when and why did... <laughs> okay, that's the answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess there, there, there might be a case for Rust. Yeah, like, well, there's a Rust guy right there. Um, but I, I, I have no idea about Rust. Maybe Elixir? Hmm. Closure? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so second question is when and why did you decide to do dgraph? Yeah. Um, so I was building something similar at Google, right? We, we, we got this knowledge graph from MetaWeb. Uh, I started working with those guys to see how we could use knowledge graph in web search. And uh, as part of that, MetaWeb actually had a graph database. They were running a single server graph database 
sort of like Neo4j. Um, and it came to Google, and that's not how Google works. Something cannot be on a single server. It has to be distributed. It has to be, they should not be a single point of failure. And so, in fact, Google didn't even have the machine to run this thing because it required lots of RAM because everything is in one server. Um, and so we started to like figure out how do we replace that? And it was called Graph D. We called it dgraph, right? Uh, so Graph D was a graph daemon. dgraph was distributed graph. And that was actually a project inside Google uh, that we were working upon. Um, but after I left, I didn't think about it. And in 2015, I was doing consulting work with somebody and I proposed to them that they should be using graph database. But then at the same time, realized that all the existing graph databases were not so good. Uh, particularly Neo4j had so many issues. Could not scale horizontally, could not perform well. Um, and I felt like I was probably one of the few people who had the experience of building something like this. So why not? Uh, graph D came from MetaWeb. Uh, we didn't build it, but uh, DGraph was a project at Google uh, back from 2011 to 2013. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, graph serving system. Yeah, you should read that. We'll say for the recording again. There's a really cool blog post. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name? Uh, why Google built a graph serving system. Yeah. Uh, it helped us a lot. Yeah. I have so, one question regarding the cache. Yeah. Uh, just before, thanks for Francis and Manish for these wonderful sessions. Thanks a lot. Uh, the question regarding cache is uh, in the session we mentioned about like the set gets dropped. There are stale data in the cache. So uh, I'm not sure how. So how it's a two works. different things, right? A new key comes in and they make no guarantees about whether we add it to the cache or not, right? But if a key already exists in the cache, then we'll definitely update it so that you don't end up getting stale data for a key. Yeah, because a miss is okay, right? You can deal with the miss. Right. But the problem is like what happens when you get stale data back. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah, one question. But, uh, how you, which tool do you use for performance of benchmarking of this thing? Go. Oh, uh, I mean, Go. like we built something in Go. No, you built on something on Go, or you use some inbuilt tool which is written in Go? Uh, I, the performance benchmarking of yeah. the things like the right? cache? Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we wrote some code in Go. Your own code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the hit ratios were already by Damian Grisky, so we modified them. Um, sort of improved. I think Aman did a bunch of that work. And uh, then we, Aman also had built the cache benchmark. Then we built a bit more. So yeah, we recovered. And then we actually got help from Ben Mains, who had written caffeine. So he knew specifically about like the right way to do benchmarks. Benchmarks, most benchmarks are wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, why, that's why I was asking yeah. which tool or some specific things you use your own code or it's just some specific standard code it's, it's a mix yeah so it's three different repositories actually one is damien's one is our own in one repository and one is a, another repository so there's three different ones but uh, we made sure that like we worked a lot with ben to make sure that we were doing it right right because it's easy to get wrong benchmarks yeah uh, so there is one quick question around now there is a lot of tools like uh, Firebase, uh, Google, uh, and other tools. So how would I pick? And also, like probably sub questions you can think is uh, how much can you scale? Because I have a lot of scalability problem. And this one with scaling, how would you convince people? Just oh, I can try to answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so out of all of the things that you mentioned, they're completely different, right? Like uh, uh, Badger and DGraph and Firebase and all these things, they're completely different kind of uh, databases. Uh, so it really depends on what your use case is. DGraph aims to be a general use case database, so you could use it for everything, right? But at the same time, if what you're doing is just doing full scans of a table, then probably use something that stores things in a table, right? So uh, if you're doing something that is analytics, maybe you have Redshift or BigQuery that specific, you know, there's some use cases that are much better uh, handled by those things. In general, what we're trying to build is something that 
is useful for all the use cases or at least as many as possible. And in general, it, it specifically, if you have a lot of different relationships that you might not be aware at, of at the beginning. So if you're merging a lot of different data sets or things like that, it, it makes sense. And when you're doing uh, pre deep joins or like you're going through just like we were talking about, like uh, starting from Pikachu and going all of the information related to the uh, like up to five levels, that is something that Postgres will not do. Right, so depending on what you're doing, it's more interesting to do one thing or the other. Uh, I just say, just give it a try. <laughs> it, is, it is open source, it is free, <laughs> try it out, right? Uh, do your benchmarks, and in general, you will see that uh, the performance that we get, except for some specific use cases, is good enough that you could use it in, in production. Scaling-wise, it scales horizontally, so you can just keep on adding more machines, and if it doesn't scale enough, let me know. <laughs> I mean, for me also, like, class plans and uh, everything is for a different, but probably let's take uh, just a batter, proxy would uh, or some similar uh, in memory uh, evaluation database. Now, how would I think? Oh. As in benchmarking, uh, other than that, how would you uh, These are not in memory databases. Like, Redis is, these are not. Um, so, between Bolt and uh, Badger, uh, just pick Badger. <laughs> um, I think the, the way you would generally think about these things is that Bolt has a different design, right? Bolt is a B plus tree, Badger is LSM tree. LSM trees are really great about giving you very high through, right throughput. That, that's why Google built that in the first place. Um, so, by the way, RocksDB was built uh, LevelDB, and then LevelDB was built by Google, and then Facebook put it RocksDB. So, it was all built at Google. Um, the, the reason to build LSM trees was that they are really good in terms of write throughput, and they still give you really good read throughput. However, B plus trees give you better read throughput. Uh, so, so, I think Badger was sort of like the idea of Badger was, was to decrease the levels that we have in the LSM tree so that the read throughput of Badger would be kind of closer to B plus trees. And it's based on the benchmarks. It is indeed like kind of neck to neck, like maybe slightly worse, but like very close to B plus trees, like both. Um, but at the same time, the write throughput then is poof, is this way better uh, than both. Um, so between, um, and then obviously you want to look at like which project is getting maintained and so on and so forth, right? all those things are important. Um, between RocksDB and uh, Badger, if you if I were in C plus plus land, I'll just probably use RocksDB, right? Um, but if you are in Go, uh, case, in fact, I think we get a bunch of inquiries from uh, these uh, Bitcoin companies, like blockchain companies. They compare Badger against RocksDB, and and some at least sometimes when they come to us, they have found Badger to perform better than RocksDB because of the ability to separate keys from values. So the throughput actually like kind of maintains over many, many days if they're doing a lot of writes. So I think it really comes down to trying it out. And uh, yeah. there's, there's also a really good blog post with a bunch of different benchmarks comparing RocksDB and, uh, and Badger. So definitely check that out too if you're interested. Um, I had a question. Uh, so as a startup, it's always useful to identify a competitor, right? So who would you consider a competitor to yourself, right? And are you guys worried about uh, like the trend which we have seen over the last couple of years is GCP has been working towards uh, bringing out stuff like big table spanner to their customers. So are you guys worried about, let's say, Google bringing out a graph database, a managed scalable graph database? Um, no, uh, I know the the fate of the internal work there, so it's something very custom that they have right now that they can't like launch publicly unless you have something more. Open sourcing something from Google into the outside is incredibly yeah. hard. Yeah. Uh, Kubernetes took many years to open source something, uh, and even that in general, it's very like it's very much integrated into like Google three and things like that. So just making it open, it is really, really hard. So I'm personally not worried about that. Plus, uh, I mean, I know the people, right? So they are not, they're not building anything generic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other question was competitors. I think uh, Neo4j is obviously the biggest one. The, the thing is like, 
by the time somebody has reached to degraph, they already have tried Neoforge. They already know it doesn't work for them, so we don't really see them much as a competitor. Um, and I also like we don't really try to to optimize so much and like steal away from Neo4j. I know a company which is whose sole job is to like go to Neo4j customers and be like, come to us. Uh, we don't do that. I think uh, what the way we are running DGraph is that we feel there's a bigger market out there. The whole GraphQL world is like it's really big and expanding, and we should rather like just bite off some of that SQL, uh, traditionally SQL market, and bring that to graphs than to bite into another graph and vendor. Yeah, if we're able to provide something like a fully managed database that scales and provides GraphQL, that serves a humongous amount of people, front-end developers, mobile developers, that right now they do not have an option. They need to learn some extra language. To the graph, I see that uh, for distributed consensus, graph protocol is in. So any plan for like newer data structure like CRDT is going to be supported in the DGraph going forward. Because now we have you have the type system, right? So CRDT data type is another type that can may replicate it concurrently without the consensus. So that's. Uh, it took us a while to stabilize the graph. <laughs> so I'm not changing anything major. Values um, and then increment them, update them however you want. Uh, it happens in one query, so it so kind of gives you some of those things, but not everything. So, in general, CRDTs would not make much sense unless we had something that was like offline, and then you need to integrate that data back. Right now, you need to do in, uh, transactions which are synchronous, so that would not make much sense. I don't know what CRDT is. Conflict resolution. DT. <laughs> so type, DT. Data type. Uh, quick question. Uh, uh, what are the pros and cons of open sourcing your uh, like DGraph and these, these big projects? Like, uh, as a company, what kind of like benefits or, uh, or some kind of uh, competitors taking advantage of that? Like, uh, yeah. yeah, can you? Yeah. There's, a, there's a part which is hiring, which, by the way, we're hiring. <laughs> um, I, I feel like every infrastructure company at this at this point um, should be open sourcing their infrastructure because companies, other companies who are adopters of this, they feel a lot better about taking an open source project that they can potentially contribute back to. They can look at the code, they can verify it, they can see whether it actually does what it says it does, so and so forth. And in case the the vendor company shuts down, they can potentially pick up that project and just continue to work with it over time. And um, I mean, I don't think I don't see many many closed source infra companies these days, at least startups. There's a counter example of why this should be open source. Uh, I don't know if you heard about Path. Path was providing a super cool like Firebase competitor. Facebook bought it and they shut it down. And they shut it down and they were like, oh, but do not worry, we're gonna open source it. By rewriting the whole thing in a different programming language, didn't work. So yeah, being open source from scratch is actually really important if you wanna be like a reliant project, rely regardless of you know, the funding that you might get. Yeah. Uh, I have a question related to a badger. Like when you store the data, do you compress? Uh, or like you just use a flat buffer? Like I heard one of your talks. Uh, we don't use flat buffers anymore. This was in DGraph. Um, compression is coming. Uh, uh, so we have a couple of people working on badger, including uh, uh, right there. And uh, so we added encryption and compression as going coming in. Yeah. Another question, like uh, I was just looking at your repos badger or DGraph. I'm not sure. Like I was just looking at the main method. Like you have a get max process 128 something. Is there any reason, like? You have given a number. Yeah, we Go was, it was very hard to get like the random read throughput in Go. Um, and uh, I had to bounce it around, ask in forums and stuff, and ultimately ended up in front of, uh, what's the name of the guy who was running it? Russ Cox. Russ Cox, yeah. Uh, and, and so Russ, Russ figured out that the issue was uh, that 
as you run a go routine which makes a system call if the system call doesn't like finish uh, in small amount of time then that that go routine just goes like gets blocked and then go has to create a new go routine at some point to replace it and so the throughput that you can get is sort of multiplexed via the number of go max blocks so we set it to 128 and to actually even 64 and we found that we could then do the random reads on ssds that we needed for badger right um, and that's why we said it i think that's threats not go routines the threats yeah 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 sorry right does dgraph for does cross data centers and uh, replication or does it support as of now or uh, you have in the roadmap or so dgraph does the same kind of application that spanner does which is consistent application synchronous application and so what you would do is if you have let's say different data centers you would put one replica in each right so that the users closest to the data center would hit that replica and be able to like query stuff um, the only difference between dgraph and spanner uh, would be in terms of how dgraph allocates timestamps so for dgraph to allocate a timestamp for a transaction it has to talk to zero um, so ideally you can put zero somewhere in a nicer location where they can achieve but um, there are ways around it to make reads faster without having to access zero so yeah but yeah it should be fine to run dgraph across data centers so regarding that open sourcing question earlier, one of the disadvantages is that you have to deal with a lot of noise from you know people asking for trivial things like reaching DB shut down two years ago because of something similar. So how do you avoid that kind of thing? How do you filter out? I do not think that issues on GitHub is noise, is feedback. Uh, we will learn a lot from that. Uh, there's a lot of people that will find random issues or whatever. Sure, it takes a little bit of time to disregard the issue, but we get a lot of important uh, things that actually lead product and let us know what we should be working on. So being open source is actually great. From a product point of view, it is much easier than just having to pull around to everyone using the product. It's like, hey, could you tell me more about how you're using it? It's just like, it's just a continuous stream of feedback. So similarly, in a query space, uh, what about the metrics? Do you have one? Uh, every every query comes back with the latency numbers for how it how long it took us to parse the query, how long it took us to process the query, and then to finally convert it into JSON. So every query comes back with that. We also have uh, open census integration, so you can see internally what's going on, like which request goes to which server, and so and so forth, and how long do they take. So. Um, and if you want more, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, do you guys have a slash metrics? Yeah, we, we actually yeah. use open census metrics. Mm -hmm. So all of those are also exposed. Cool. We, we oh. actually have a Grafana which shows all of that. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering about this over the last couple of hours, right? So uh, are you guys hiring? <laughs> we, we are. Yes, oh, cool. we are. Right. I might have not mentioned it, yeah. but yeah. So, uh, I have attended a couple of Neo4j uh, sessions. So now what they do, they like, uh, they already, people know about uh, their database. Now they basically present how your data will come to us. So they present use case with Kafka and then when data with us, then how you can use in your machine learning analysis and prediction algorithms. And they basically present use cases on top of uh, after describing what is their uh, databases so do you have any plan to like give session how you can build your use cases different kind of using a uh, dgraph so yes absolutely uh one of the things that i personally want to do is getting uh, more people to become uh reference customers so we have people doing really cool stuff already in production, but uh, we need their agreement before we, they can publish, we can publish what they're doing. So we're working on that. So that's something that we want to do. And in general, we want to have more of, you know, like there's a lot of use cases that it works really well, uh, things like knowledge graphs and stuff like that. Uh, we, there's a lot of use cases that I do not think anyone is using us for yet, like machine learning. But if someone is using it, you know, it's always good to have it. Uh, oh, let's talk. There you go. So. <laughs>
but yeah, we, we want to have it in general. The documentation for the whole project is pretty young. Uh, the project is pretty young, so we're working on that. Which, by the way, reminds me of we are hiring for technical writers too. So if you're interested, let me know. <laughs> Uh, like built-in features, uh, example their use cases, uh, they want to find people near you and similar interests, uh, example page ranking and like Jacquard, Cosine, uh, some algorithms. Um, we have geo stuff which, which is nearby, but I guess this is different down here. Yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's like centrality algorithms and stuff like that, page rank and... So uh, we have some algorithms there. Uh, I think that we would like to add more. Right now, the question is whether we want those algorithms to be part of the uh, database itself. Basically, the problem is when you're inside of the database, your knowledge of the database is partial. You do not know all of the things that are going on, which makes those algorithms more complicated but more efficient or we want to have them as a top thing where you would just have a library that knows how to talk to DGraph and then you would do those algorithms. That would be easier to build and it would be much easier for people to contribute to, but at the same time, you would not get the same performance. So uh, we have not done it, we're thinking about it. Might be a silly question. Uh, how DGraph is making RAM? Oh. How Dgraph oh. is making revenue? Did we make any money? I do not know. Uh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, we make money by doing three things. Uh, one is that we uh, we support. Um, so we have some production customers who pay us to support them, and because they are in production, so they they need the assurance that in case something goes wrong, we are around, right? So we we charge for support. We then charge for enterprise features. Uh, that we just launched in 1.1, uh, which is, for example, um, is access access control, control list. list backups, binary backups, binary backups, yeah. And, and then finally, we want to run DGraph as a service, hosted service, mm -hmm. managed service, yeah, yeah. Once we have a fully managed service with GraphQL at, at the front, basically, it's a better version of Firebase, in my opinion. And we actually now have an updated pricing page, so you can go to digraph.com slash pricing and <laughs> and it has a slider at the end that you can slider. move around. Yeah, yeah. That that Francis built like two days ago. Um, so it's pretty cheap actually. So, uh, just tell me just how many users you have started. And when and what will you talk about? <laughs> so just for funk is not that it's just leaping for a long time. Uh, I so without giving too much private information, it's been a very busy year. So that's why now I'm coming to the point where it's a little bit more stable. So I'm considering going back. So hopefully by October, November, my recommends. Yeah. Uh, if you ask questions, uh, we want to give you a T-shirt, but uh, we do not know your sizes, and we don't want to guess. So you know, if you ask the question, let him know, and then just like. Go around. We have a whole bunch of smalls, uh, few mediums, and few extra larges. Yeah. So, to my question, uh, <laughs> you want a t shirt? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, but when it is B2B or any other startups which customers see as a value, uh, it might be easy for you to convince uh, uh, investors. Uh, this is very dev focused or like developers could understand more of the value of the product. Uh, so in that case, I'm assuming like there would be difficulty in convincing investors. So how, what is your strategy or how do you go about that? Like you have a developer product versus some B2B doing some fancy things. Um, so I think um, it, it would be typically hard, I guess, but what happens is like, there's a bunch of like investors who are focused on open source infrastructure companies. Uh, so for example, Bain Capital invested in us and the, the, the guy there, he has invested in Redis Labs, he's invested in like uh, other open source infra companies. And then we just got invested by Redpoint Ventures and they've invested in CockroachDB, they've invested in um, Snowflake, I want to say, or some things. Um, so, so there is enough sort of knowledge now that they realize the benefit of, of open source projects making it big into, into B2B. Um, 
that uh, I don't think it was, it was, I mean, it's, it's generally hard for graph databases to raise money. Um, but uh, from infrastructure perspective, it's relatively easier. There's also the point of view of uh, being successful with developers actually will also hopefully make you successful with companies like the typical example is Docker, right? Docker was not an enterprise thing, it was a thing that many developers found cool and they started using it. And once they know that they like it, uh, it kind of goes bottom up and then people are they're gonna be like, well, all my employees are talking about Docker, why not? So being open source helps with that too. And you can tell them that the GitHub stars are rising. So they do consider that. <laughs> yep. One, one second, the mic. I'm from the uh, storage company, my data. So do you see a use case of uh, uh, where we can optimize some database uh, performance uh, means you usually see a community means questions on the community that uh, we want this kind of performance and we expect that your storage should perform this this much. So do you see with any use case where we can optimize our uh, storage and for your database? You provide SSDs, hard disks or? So means, uh, we have written software to uh, perform any kind of uh, stories, let's say SSDs or SDD or ASCII. So it depends. You could contribute to Badger. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful to everybody. DGraph uses Badger, that's our storage. Thanks. All right. Same in case of like in memory persistency or cache. So, did you guys any took any inspiration yeah. from this kind of products? In FluxDB, not particularly, but I mean RocksDB, yes, a lot of stuff from RocksDB and uh, uh, Bigtable, HBase, uh, Pinax, um, Spanner, like. Yeah, so it's like there's a lot of papers involved in like trying to build what we build. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. Uh, hey Manish, uh, I wanted to follow up on the database profiling question. So, do you have something for exporting slow queries from the B graph? Uh, something similar to like the statistic collector from Postgres or the current top in MongoDB? Um, I mean, I think every query comes back with the latency number, so you could technically figure out yourself like it was slow. Okay, right? so, uh, so what if I want to export it to some third party like Grafana or Prometheus or something like that, or ELK, probably something like metric beats, which ships logs. So I want something that, can, uh, that I can use to pluck metrics from dgraph to uh, dashboard. Yeah, you want open census. You want yeah, we support okay. open census. Yeah. Yeah. And we even have a Grafana like dashboard for dgraph. Uh, it's yeah. all out there. Yeah, but okay. if you want tracing for like specific query, what was going on and right. what service it hit and all that stuff, exactly. that's open census. Okay. Yeah. So we have that. In fact, Jaeger, which is what we use written by Uber, actually uses Badger internally. So it's kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> So we use Jaeger to like look at our traces and they are using Badger. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you come to for search engines kind of thing, uh, most people like search engines use Apache Solar and other stuff for uh, the particular purpose. How do you think uh, DGraph will scale in that kind of domain? That kind of what? Like web searches, like explicitly we use like in my previous company for your, like indexing searching, right? Index searching. So you are using Apache Solar. So how do you think DGraph will perform, like go with uh, Apache Solar and that stuff? I think they use Lucene Index uh, and uh, we also do full text, for example. And so I've heard from some companies who, who want to use graph operations on Elasticsearch, for example, and Elastic, I think, says that they have graph operations, but it doesn't do them very well. And so they have tried using DGraph's full text search with um, with with also the graph operations and so I've heard about those cases, but uh, we haven't really benchmarked to see like how fast is 
deep graph full text search compared to elastic or sorter yeah would be interesting Last five questions. Uh, you can still shoot them the questions on like problem. How good is DGraph on top of Kubernetes? Uh, most people use DGraph on top of Kubernetes. So do you have an operator for that or just in container? We don't have an operator yet. We have, uh, I forgot the word. Um, Config? Yes, Helm chart. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, and also just a YAML file that you can deploy if you want to like kubectl create dash f done and you get it running we don't have an operator we'll like to work on that eventually to manage things like how often you want to run backups and stuff like that but we don't have that yet so uh, how come uh, structured uh, like structured queries uh, perform on uh, graph because like this name indicates it it is supported for graph, but like traditional table type uh, queries and that kind of story, will you still recommend uh, graph DB for, sorry, uh, dgraph for that? Or will you have different recommendation in that particular case if you have only table based uh, application? Um, yeah, I generally believe that if you're using like, if you have more than five tables kind of interconnected, that's a perfect graph use case. And I think with GraphQL, what we're trying to prove that is that graph database can be used for just building apps. And a lot of people actually using dgraph are just building apps using dgraph, social apps or uh, websites even. In fact, one of the, our big users has built an entire platform on dgraph. Um, and they took data from the traditional relational databases, put that into dgraph and running building apps on top of it and real time analysis and so on and so forth, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I absolutely think that if you were using SQL before, you could switch to dgraph. Yeah, in general, if you're using SQL, like uh, you do your relational database, right? Like you're gonna get a row every time. If you, out of the row, that row, you don't care about the whole thing. That's why you use column-based storage, like big table and stuff like that. You're gonna get a similar advantage with us because we store everything separately mm -hmm. too. So, any, any, have you seen any relational letters migration to the dgraph? Any, and like enterprise customers. You, this one I just mentioned, right? So they were, they, they built an entire platform on DGraph. No, that is for the mobile app or maybe for the enterprise app. Uh, the platform actually is supporting many different things. They, they have an app, but they also have like real-time analytics and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah like CRM or uh, Salesforce. Or you could build that. Like for instance, if you think about like Airtable and uh, Asana or Trello or all of those things where they basically, you can have links in any way to anything, that's a graph. So that is a very good use case. I do not think that uh, Asana or Trello is using it. Uh, I had a meeting two weeks ago with someone that was building something similar and was considering using us. Hey, um, this is almost certainly a stupid question. Um, but one of the things with databases, especially when you're doing transaction processing, is that you want exactness, right? Uh, whereas when you're working with relationships, like when you work with graphs, you're looking at it's okay not to be perfect, but it's kind of kind of right, right? When you're looking at relationships, like let's say you're finding friends on Facebook. Now, this seems to be an area where you don't get exactness, but somewhere in the vicinity area of correctness using something like machine learning, right? So what what I'm asking is, is like graph databases slowly being cannibalized by the idea of machine learning where you get relationships in some sort, right? So you, let's say you can't substitute SQL databases, which has OLTP, but is this area slowly, uh, would it become less relevant with more machine learning that is coming in? No. Uh, I would say no, because uh, machine learning, that's going to give you something that is probably true. Uh, but when you're using a database, you want to have exactness, as you were saying, right? Like, this is not, right? Like in some example, cases, in some cases, being in, in exact most cases where graph databases are used, the exactness is that uh, so important? Yes. Let's say your friends or relationships. Yeah, imagine, imagine if you're looking for a friend, it doesn't appear, or all of a sudden someone that is not a friend of yours appears, right? Like there's some things that uh, we are considering that will basically give you approximate counts. Uh, that is one of the things that using hyper log log counts, but that is a very specific use case that you know exactness is not as important because you per, you you're valuing uh, performance more 
in general, we care a lot about validity of the data over performance. Like uh, in BV 1.1.0, we ended up having something going three times lower or something like that, uh, although we had made it like 10 times faster before. But like we made it like three times lower as it was just because otherwise the data was not exact, right? Uh, having the right data in the database is super important. Once you're doing data, uh, machine learning and machine learning nowadays, it, it, there's a lot of research based on machine learning, uh, graph-based machine learning where the input is a graph. Uh, then in there, if they still care about the validity of that data, even though the things that they're going to be uh, providing those uh, predictions might not be exact, right? Those are two different fields. When you're storing data, you want to retrieve the same data. When you're predicting things, not being exact is fine. So for us, having the right data is, so, is super important. And that's why, for instance, we have things like, I think we're the only graph database that passes Jepson test. So Jepson is basically something is like hell for distributed systems. It just it tries to break it in so many in as many ways as possible. And it's something that we work on. Like it's something that we really care about because it's important that if you store something, it needs to be there later. Yep. Yep. There's been a report last year. Uh, this question is more related to feature of the graph where I mean in a relational world, right? We have our tables where we define the permissions around it that particular users have some permissions and particular users will have only readability kind of right. So I mean in the D graph what uh, I mean similar feature uh, is it there and how, how you do define that? Yeah, so uh, we have this new feature released with 1.1.0, uh, which is, uh, it's called access control lists, and they are at a predicate level. So what you can say is like, this predicate is visible. Like, let's say that, you know, name is definitely not something that people care that much. It's a pretty public thing. So you could say name is completely public, but this other predicate that contains social security number that is only accessible to this group of people. Yeah, you define it. It's basically access control list based on predicates, and uh, then you have like different users and groups of users and stuff like that. Hi, uh, I just had a small doubt regarding the alphas and all. Since you said the data is distributed in the alphas and you know the web UI, the red tail or whatever you call it. So uh, how does it know? What was the function of zeros in there? How does it know from which alpha it has to get the data? So zeros uh, keep track of the membership information. And they stream out the membership information every every few seconds or so to all the alpha. So every alpha knows which data is on which alpha, and they can redirect the queries correctly without talking to zero. Without talking to zero, the alpha also maintains data for the other alphas also. Yeah, each each uh, every every server in DGraph has a connection to every other server. Uh, they might not be doing anything with it, but they still have an open connection. Um, and so if a query comes to, let's say, alpha group one, and some data is in alpha group two, it's going to like send the query to alpha group two for that particular part of the query. Because a typical graph query would access many different predicates. Predicates might be on different groups. And so each alpha would serve some data potentially from itself or potentially from other groups. Yeah. And when it does that, it, there's things that we use to optimize that even further. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is just my last question to Francis. So you actually uh, did Jasper Funk and you go to a lot of conferences and you have a huge impact and now you're in, uh, here as a VP. So what is your, like, how did you manage it? How did you start that community engagement and probably your goals and priorities? Like, how was that? I think that it's a similar answer to what he was saying about how to be a CEO and CTO and all that stuff. You don't sleep much. <laughs> but uh, in general, I'd say that uh, I try to do what helps the community. So that's partly why I joined DGraph. I think that DGraph has a huge positive impact in the Go community and in general. Uh, it is fully open source. Uh, they all, like The kind of technology they're open sourcing is something that you don't see that often uh, coming from small startups. Like it's something that I, you would expect maybe Google open sourcing, but not a small company, right? So for me, it was very important. And uh, I keep on going to conferences, even though I try to travel less, I, I still travel a lot. And being able to go to conferences and talk about something, about a project that I'm sure has a positive impact and I'm proud of, it's always good. Okay, so we shouldn't sleep to do that. <laughs> I woke up at 5 a.m. today, <laughs> if that helps. Uh Thank you so much.
like you can close it but you if you have any more questions shoot out to them uh, they'll be uh, they, they have their twitter id uh, you can reach out to them there right that's the best way yeah okay we have some extra t-shirts i think and we have also stickers we have two small t-shirts we have two smalls <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, can I request all of you to please uh, sit down for like two minutes? <laughs> Just two more minutes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here. Uh, this has definitely been the most interactive Go Meetup we've had this year, or probably last few years, maybe. I mean, we definitely anticipated that it's going to be a very interactive session, but uh, thanks for making it so. Uh, and. Uh, we, are, we are very happy with the way this has turned out. Uh, big uh, thanks to all the speakers for putting out the content and making this happen. Uh, also, huge thanks to Hotstar for hosting us, especially Deepayan, who is here. Uh, uh, just to give you some background, uh, a lot of the planning for this meetup happened in the last one week. And Deepayan was the only point of contact from Hotstar. Uh, who helped this happen. And uh, I know there are a lot of people from Hotstar here uh, helping out. Uh, and you guys are doing it despite having a meetup tomorrow, which is a fairly big one. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, just to give you, um, I mean, I, I mentioned all of this in the just before we started the day. Uh, so, among the things that we run uh, as part of the Go Bangalore community, we have two meetup groups. One is the regular monthly meetup group, and we have something else called a Go Study Group, which uh, which is an online uh, um, sort of a setting where uh, we have a Zoom call for one hour, uh, typically once in two weeks. Uh, it has been fairly irregular as of now because we are basically looking out for a lot of participation from the community. So if uh, you guys are definitely interested, please uh, pitch in your ideas uh, and that will help us uh, schedule these things uh, in a much better way. Uh, we are also starting off with Women Who Go, uh, a Bangalore chapter of this. Uh, the person who is heading this is Jyotsna Gupta. She, she couldn't make it to the meetup today, but uh, we plan to have the first meetup uh, sometime this month. Um, I mean, it's, uh, Jyotsna is going to run it. Uh, we are not the organizers for it. Uh, but if you guys, uh, because Josna is not here, if you want some more information about it, please feel free to reach out uh, to us. Um, thanks everyone for like really taking your time out to come. Um, Francis, thanks a lot. Thanks, Manish. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, the uh, the second initiative is called Go Study Group. Uh, 